We are now live streaming. Good afternoon, evening, wherever you're watching us from. Um, welcome to the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association's Big Hearted Warrior Tour with a special edition related to HCM genetics. We are incredibly happy to have with us four amazing speakers, which you're going to be hearing from tonight. And we hope that when you leave this webinar, you will have a deeper appreciation for the genetics in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is an interactive program. If you are watching us on Facebook, I'm gonna make sure that you're actually there. It says you are, I'm gonna double check. You will not be able to ask any questions live. You will have to jump in and join us in the webinar and the link is available on the Facebook page. This is 6 p.m. August 18th, 2022. If you are watching this at some other time, we are pre-recorded and thereby you're not going to be able to ask any questions, but you can post them below and we will be more than happy to address them for you or get our, our, our faculty to answer the questions for you if you email us at support at 4hcm.org. Okay, let's just make sure we're live here on Facebook. Give me one little second. That one. And we are live and we are in a box and I'm looking at my phone on Facebook. Okay, <clears throat> so I am going to start today off. We have 31 attendees so far in this group. We have over 130 registered for tonight. So they'll be filtering in. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on here at the HCMA in our brand new office and tell you a little bit about some of the projects we have coming up for the next couple of months. And I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you as well right now. So we need to go. They, oops, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong view. Let me take that down. I'm not in present mode. I'm the one that made the mistake on that one today. Um, okay, here we go. Sorry about it. So before, before I go back to that screen, let me just say, Welcome to Dr. Farhan Ahmad, Dr. Eric Adler, Dr. Carolyn Ho, and genetic counselor extraordinaire Colleen Kalashu. And thank you all for joining us today. And you'll come off mute later and you'll tell us all about yourself. We have Julie Russo here from the HCMA team who will help you with any administrative questions or problems you have during the event. And if you can't log in, you're not watching. So we'll call Julie. All right, so here we go. I wanna thank our sponsors for today's event, uh, Tanaya Therapeutics and Biomarin, two companies you may not have heard of much in the space of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but you will in the coming months and years. So we want to thank them for their support of this particular event. Okay, our agenda for tonight, we are going to hear from Dr. Carolyn Ho on what are the genes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? We've talked a lot about uh, genetic testing since approximately 2005, but we're gonna talk tonight about the practical applications of genetic information with Colleen Kalashu. We're gonna talk about HCM research, where genetics are heading with Dr. Farhan Ahmad. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up with the real life uh, utilization of genetic therapy in an HCM spectrum disorder, specifically Dannon's disease. We will address all of your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. We will take some questions during the, at the break of each individual uh, speaker. And in the event you have any questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the webinar. You're welcome to put your questions in at any time. You may wanna hold on the send button until the talk is over because your question may be answered. Uh, please don't use the chat button for, feature, for questions because we're not going to be monitoring it for that. That's for technical support. So now I've done all my housekeeping. Um, I wanted to talk to you about an exciting project that the HCMA has been working on for over two years, and that is called the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. We know that HCM is an incredibly common disorder, and we just don't know where all these people are hiding right now. So in an attempt to identify the undiagnosed, the HCMA back a few years ago passed some legislation in the state of New Jersey to include some questions in the well-child examination and to improve sports screenings of student athletes to help better detect HCM and other cardiac disorders, genetic and acquired. So we have drafted some legislation and we are very excited that we're gonna be launching it 
in about 15 states over the next year and a half to two years. And if you are at all interested in learning more about the act, you can go to the website. Basically what it does is it makes sure that the same questions that we ask of student athletes are being asked in well child examinations. And we start to have people asking specific questions like, does anybody in your family have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or a list of other disorders? It's not just an HCN specific piece of legislation. We are also providing <clears throat> the infrastructure for professional development and professional education so that we can help physicians, family practice physicians, pediatricians, et cetera, understand the diseases that they're looking for and when to make appropriate referrals. So if you wanna learn more about it, please visit 4hcm.org and you'll see the information in our advocacy area on the website. I also wanna take a moment to remind you all that we have a program called HCM Academy. And this is medical education to help physicians understand HCM at a deeper level. We will be going into year two of this program starting in November. There will be some changes <clears throat> and there will be some new content. So if you would like your local cardiologist to learn more about HCM, you can register them right on our website in, under HCM Academy. And you can put their name and address in there and we will send them an invitation or you can invite them to the website themselves where they can register themselves for a session of HCM Academy. <clears throat> I apologize for the coughing. It is residual from COVID back in May and it is still with me. <clears throat> so this would be the page that you would see on the HCMA website, refer your provider where I am a provider and we will help you get hooked up with the HCM Academy and the educational content there. Um, as many of you who are watching are already aware, the HCMA has long held a program called our HCMA Recognized Centers of Excellence, and we continue to grow this program out. We are not quite ready to make two public announcements yet, but this summer the board has approved two new centers to join this team, and you'll be hearing more about them come the fall. So as of right now, we actually have 46 HCMA Recognized Center of Excellence programs, and tonight you're hearing from representatives from three of them, which is always fun when we cross over and the centers get to work with each other. So if you're interested in more information about HCMA Recognized Centers of Excellence, you can find that on our website. If you are watching on Facebook, you already know about our Facebook community. If you're joining us in the webinar, I wanna let you know that there are <clears throat> multiple platforms in which you can speak to your peers about your HCM diagnosis and life with HCM. If you're watching on our page, this is a page, it's a forward facing piece of Facebook. If you would like to participate in our private group, you have to remember that it's not quite private private, it just doesn't show up on your feed on Facebook. So you can talk to your HCM peers or our moderators about your questions, comments, concerns, they can point you to resources. Um, we currently have about 9,000 people in our private group. So you're gonna get a wealth of information and experiences. We also have a parents group. And as maybe you've heard, we're building out our international uh, endeavors by having parented Facebook groups to ours that they can speak in their native language. We have a Swedish group, we have a Dutch group, and we have other groups that are forming <clears throat> and you can speak in your own language um, and be comfortable doing that. And we also have co-branded materials with different organizations and translations of our materials um, are slowly being built out in different languages. Our discussion group leaders will be <clears throat> joining me tomorrow for podcasting. But if you want to join a discussion group, the HCMA now offers at least three groups a week where you can meet with your peers and have online discussion uh, in a Zoom format on topics of interest. We have mental wellness, we have living with an ICD, preparing for a myectomy, post myectomy. Um, family life with HCM, and a lot of other groups. So you can learn about those on the website as well. And these are some of our amazing HCMA volunteers. We have writers, we have lawyers, we have kindergarten teachers and everything in between in our uh, discussion group leaders. So I encourage you to learn about that. And Tales from the Heart will be tomorrow morning. We podcast pretty much once a week, Friday mornings typically. Uh, we started about 11 o'clock. We are live on Facebook at that time. 
And we have a number of different physicians who are scheduled to be with us on regular intervals. But tomorrow we have a special segment where we're going to have the discussion group leaders here to talk about what their experiences have been in the discussion groups and also to get some of your feedback for topics that you might want to learn more about, groups that we might want to set up. And um, back tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, right here on Facebook. Uh, lastly, and importantly for the topic of tonight, Invitae is also one of our partners. While they're not a specific sponsor of this particular webinar, they are an ongoing partner with us and they are providing free genetic testing. Ambry is now also doing this, but I don't have all of their information on our website. Um, this is uh, what we call industry-sponsored testing. So if you have been diagnosed with HCM or a member of your family has, you may qualify for the DETECT program. And that is a no cost genetic test. And that might help you understand your family's HCM a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to pause there. This is probably the quickest talk I've ever done because I know you really don't wanna hear me talk tonight. You wanna hear our faculty talk, but I wanna thank our presenters, our Center of Excellence partners, our staff, our board, our volunteers, and of course, Brandy, who is my heart donor. Without her, I would not be with you here today. So this is your reminder to make sure you sign your organ donation card because you never know when you might be a hero. And on that note, I'm going to stop my presentation and I am going to ask Dr. Carolyn Ho to come on the screen and welcome to Tales from, or Tales from the Heart. Welcome to the Big Hearted Warrior Tour. You'll be with us in another couple of weeks with your team from Brigham. But today you're here to talk to us about genetics. Great, well, thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure to, to join everybody um, tonight. Um, so first of all, you know, um, I wanna just check to make sure everybody can hear me okay and that you're seeing um, my full screen, not the pre presenter view screen. You are good to go, thank you. Excellent. Um, so my name is Carolyn Ho. I'm the medical director of the Cardiovascular Genetic Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And I've been, just really, um, the, you know, my entire career, I've, I've been um, intrigued by how um, increased knowledge of how the genetic basis of disease can help us better um, understand and treat um, disease. And that's um, really borne out in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, in, a, in a really fascinating way over the past um, handful of years. And so I'd love to share some of that with you. And I've taken the liberty of slightly changing the title of my talk instead of uh, what are genes in HCM, which would be a drier and perhaps shorter talk. I, you know, I went, really wanted to um, help to emphasize you know, why genetics actually matters in HCM. So I'll be um, speaking about that. Right, so genetics can help to bring much more precision to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and to any um, genetic um, condition. We can try to start identifying individual differences and in specific subgroups from broader populations because not all HCM is the same. Um, and also we can start to transition from our traditional one size fits all to a much more individual and personalized approach. So instead of um, pr providing treatment that is best for the average patient, we can provide treatment which is best for you for a specific patient. Um, and um, this all stems from understanding the biology and the genetic basis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so from its first description a number of decades ago, HCM has been recognized to run in families and therefore have a genetic basis. So astute cardiologists working with um, basic scientists helped to figure out this whole story. Uh, so here's a pedigree showing the um, individuals in, um, that are filled in in black as um, those that are affected with, with HCM. You can see that roughly half of the family is involved. And here is one of the first families that um, was um, studied with HCM. They're um, a French Canadian uh, family outside of Montreal. These are actually three brothers. This um, individual um, is not a member of the family, he's a neighbor that jumped in on the, on the photo op, um, but these three brothers um, uh, belong to a family with really severe um, consequences from HCM and a lot of sudden death and indeed um, all three of them died suddenly before um, they were four years of age. And so 
by looking at the genetic features that were present in those relatives that have HCM and comparing it to the relatives that did not have HCM, um, scientists led by John and Cricket Seidman and their colleagues were able to establish the paradigm that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a disease of the sarcomere. They were able to identify that there were um, disease-causing detrimental variants in the genes that um, encode the sarcomere apparatus. This is a molecular motor of the heart. Um, and a, a change in any one of those 11 or so different genes that are involved in the actual um, force generation um, involved or involved in the regulation of this um, was enough to cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if we look at all comers with HCM, um, about 30% have positive genetic testing results. And right now, um, you know, the genetics of HCM really is largely focused around um, determining whether or not sarcomere mutations are present, uh, uh, because that's uh, where the, the money tends to be. Um, so if we just take all comers with a clinical diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, about 30% of them will have um, a, a pathogenic or likely pathogenic sarcomere variants um, identified. And Colleen will go through um, this in much greater detail in her talk. Um, if we focus just on those with a family history of HCM, so if you have a family history of HCM, that increases the a priori likelihood that there is genetic disease. And in that situation, over 60% of um, individuals tested um, are found to have um, a, a pathogenic or likely pathogenic sarcomere mutation. And this helps because um, it helps us understand that not all sick hearts are HCM. So here's an example of genetics in action. Um, all of these patients were given a diagnosis of HCM and appear very similar on imaging. They have a thick heart, um, but they actually have very different underlying diseases. Um, so this first individual is a 36-year-old woman that has stereotypical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A myosin heavy chain um, mutation was identified, um, and so this identifies her as having sarcomeric HCM. Um, this individual is a 40-year-old woman that actually had Noonan syndrome um, that was very, uh, with the features were, that were quite isolated to her heart. She had a, a mutation not in a sarcomere gene, but rather in a gene in a different pathway, um, and that identified that she had Noonan syndrome and her management would be, would be different. Um, this uh, gentleman actually has Fabry disease, again, with a very cardiac specific phenotype um, or manifestations that predominantly affected his heart only and not other organs. Um, he had a, um, a mutation in the alpha galactosidase gene identified, and he was started on enzyme replacement therapy, a very specific therapy for a, a specific disease, not HCM. Um, and this was a 70 year old um, gentleman that was actually uh, had found to have cardiac amyloidosis. Um, genetic testing did not find um, a, a change in the, uh, the gene that's most commonly associated with amyloidosis. Uh, so this suggests that he has um, that his, his normal protein actually started acting abnormally, um, but there are no implications to his family. It's not genetic. He cannot pass it on to his um, offspring. Um, and he, there are all sorts of new therapies that are um, available and highly effective for amyloidosis. So it's important to know what disease you're treating and genetics can, can help us get those important insights. And so to try to um, address some of the fundamental questions regarding genotype, phenotype, and outcomes, we've recently been able to establish a large international multicenter consortium called the Sarcomeric Human Cardiomyopathy Registry, or SHARE. And the participating institutions, we all kept our own institutional databases of our patients, you know, maybe a few hundred patients at each um, site. Um, and you can learn some, some information, but really not that much by studying just as, you know, your own sm relatively small group of patients. But if we work together and, um, and join as a team and put all, and uh, combine all of our um, data, um, we can be much more powerful. And in doing so, we have a centralized database that has over 9,000 patients with HCM um, represented. Over 60% have genetic testing. And so this has helped us confirm that genotype actually matters. Um, so if we look at a large cohort of patients from SHARE and look to, um, at those that had genetic testing, and we can um, separate separate out those that have sarcomeric HCM in green. So these are individuals that had genetic testing and had a pathogenic or likely pathogenic um, uh, variant in a sarcomere gene identified. Um, and if we compare them to non-sarcomeric HCM, this is the red line, um, and see how they do over time and see how many people remain free of um, an endpoint that um, kind of, that combines all sorts of um, 
you know, unpleasant things that can happen to people with um, HCM. So there's all cause death. There's a need for getting a heart transplant or needing mechanical assistance. There's cardiac arrest, sudden death, or appropriate ICV discharge. There's developing severe symptom symptoms from heart failure. There's atrial fibrillation and stroke. And so you can see that those people in green with sarcomeric HCM um, accumulated events at an uh, earlier um, time and at a faster pace than those um, with non-sarcomeric HCM in red. And that held not just for this combination of all of these um, different outcomes, but for each outcome individually. You can see that um, those with sarcomeric HCM um, tended to do worse than those with non-sarcomeric HCM. So everything's to the right of this line, indicating that those with sarcomeric HCM um, did worse. And they did worse you know, uh, two to um, almost five times worse than those with non-sarcomeric HCM. So understanding your genetic substrate gives us some um, indication of how um, people do, you know, particularly when studying populations, taking that back to the individual is a little bit um, trickier, but, you know, trying to understand how uh, populations will fare over time, um, um, there's, uh, uh, there's power in genetic testing. And then also HCM has traditionally been considered to develop in um, adolescence or early adulthood. Child on, childhood onset HCM is a well-known, also uh, somewhat rare entity. Um, and, um, and so we wanted to see um, how HCM um, uh, behaved across the lifespan and, can, and really take a deeper dive into childhood onset HCM. Um, and here too, we found that genotype can impact um, the age of diagnosis. So the first thing that um, we did was to um, look and share and to get a sense of the distribution of when um, people were diagnosed with HCM. How old were they um, when they were diagnosed? And you can see that there seem to be three different peaks um, in this distribution. There's an early peak in infancy, so this is less than one year of age. Um, there's a second peak um, in um, late adolescence and early adulthood, kind of centering in the late teenage years. And then there's a third broader peak um, that kind of centers around age 50, um, but kind of tails on to like above, um, you know, to people even in their mid late 70s um, of being diagnosed with HCM. And if we overlay um, the uh, genetic testing, you can see that the earlier peak is dominated by those with sarcomeric HCM, um, those that had a sarcomere mutation. And the later peak in pink is dominated by those with non-sarcomeric HCM. So how can we use these and other insights to try to improve your care? How can we translate some of these um, insights into practice? Well, here's um, how we think about the, um, the landscape of HCM, the disease pathways, and, and, and um, our current approach. So you can think about the sarcomeric variant kind of lighting the fuse. Um, and we've done research before that has, that has shown that the sarcomere variant itself um, uh, has uh, consequence. So um, HCM is, is interesting and like other um, genetic diseases, um, the manifestations again, tend to emerge in adulthood. Um, and that's when people tend to be uh, diagnosed, right? We just looked at that um, slide that said that people are most commonly um, diagnosed somewhere between um, adolescence and even through to, through to middle age. Um, but um, that's despite the fact that you inherit the, the gene mutation that causes HCM at birth or develop it shortly thereafter. Um, so we were interested in trying to look to see in that preclinical phase, when you have a sarcomeric variant, but you don't have a diagnosis of HCM, are there any manifestations of the sarcomere variant itself? And it turns out that there are some fundamental effects of the sarcomere variant. The um, heart size tends to be a little bit smaller. The function tends to be hypercontractile uh, or, or super vigorous. Um, there can be um, abnormalities in how well the heart relaxes. It doesn't relax as well as a heart without a sarcomere variant. Um, there's increased signals for causing scar tissue or fibrosis. And the energy um, usage of the heart is not as efficient. So there, it costs more um, for each um, beat that's produced. And so that's primary effects of the sarcomere variant, even before um, there has been any thickening or hypertrophy of the heart. And then as time goes on, as, you, uh, as people get older, um, and as the impact of other genetic modifiers, as the impact of lifestyle and other um, medical conditions may um, 
uh, come to play, then clinically overt HCM can develop. And that's when you're diagnosed with HCM because your heart has become sick. Um, and it's really only in that stage um, that uh, people start to experience some of the symptoms and the unwelcome outcomes related to HCM. So we know that if you have outflow tract obstruction and you have symptoms, we can start beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, disapyramide, or think about invasive septal reduction therapy. We always look to uh, try to risk stratify for ventricular arrhythmias and see who might best um, uh, benefit from having an ICD placed. If atrial fibrillation develops, we um, try to reduce risk of stroke by giving blood thinners or anticoagulants. And we also try to control heart rate and heart rhythm. And if uh, um, you're one of the unfortunate people that develops more advanced remodeling um, with advanced symptoms or a decrease in the pumping function of the heart, um, then we uh, switch over to um, uh, uh, standard management for that um, situation and think about heart transplantation. And so you can see that our current treatment targets symptoms primarily, and it's effective for many, but not all patients. We start very late in disease evolution, and we haven't been able to develop disease-specific or disease-modifying therapies yet. And, even, and we also repurpose um, medications that were developed for other purposes, um, and there's sparse evidence regarding their efficacy. So there's certainly room for improvement, and that improvement can come through a better understanding of disease mechanism. So the better we understand you know, how a disease develops, the better we can um, identify new targets uh, for therapy and more specific and more effective um, uh, 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 strategies. And so if we think about how the heart functions, there's um, normally exquisitely regulated interactions between uh, two different uh, filaments in the sarcomere. There's a thick filament and a thin filament. And the thick filament has um, these heads of the myosin heavy chain um, molecule that grab onto the, the thin filament, propel um, the thick and thin filament against each other to, for the um, heart to contract, and then lets go and lets the filament slide apart so the heart can relax. And this is normally very carefully orchestrated and it results in normal contractility and effective relaxation. So one model of thinking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that there are too many um, of these cross bridges, um, these active, the, the myosin heads are engaged, too many myosin heads are engaged on the thin filament. So it's like too many oars in the water trying to row the boat. Um, and so this leads to the hypercontractility or the excessively vigorous um, pumping function that we see with HCM. It leads to impaired relaxation and the altered myocardial energetics, the increased um, energetic cost of, of, um, of the, uh, beating the heart. So um, it costs more um, you know, energy money um, to, uh, for each heartbeat. So with this in mind, um, medications have been, um, have been developed um, that are myosin inhibitors. Um, so they were developed with a specific pathophysiology, the specific disease biology of HCM in mind to try to take off um, of some of the excess of contractility. So they interfere with the cycling of um, the actin and myosin um, uh, filaments um, so that fewer heads of myosin are engaged. Um, and uh, mavicamtin is the first in class, um, one of these um, myosin inhibitors. And so it reduces the number of myosin actin cross bridges and therefore reduces the excessive um, contraction and the excessive energy expenditure that we see in hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. So we think that this will help to, again, uh, bring uh, back the um, excessive uh, force generation to, towards normal, to improve the relaxation of the heart, and to improve the, um, the cost of um, the energetic cost of um, the heart beating. So Mavicamptin um, has gone through phase one, phase two, and now phase three clinical trials and is now commercially available. I'm sure that you all know um, the um, results of the Explorer trial, which is the pivotal trial um, using Mavicamptin, where they showed that there was a large decrease in gradient and almost surgical level of decrease, decrease in gradient of um, about 50 millimeters of mercury. Um, and we know that these myosin inhibitors decrease the vigor of the pumping of your heart. So we know that ejection fraction is going to fall. And indeed, that's the reason why they're being so carefully monitored, uh, because um, if you if, if you get too much, or some people may be um, um, more sensitive to it than others, we can reduce the ejection fraction more than we wish to. Um, but overall, 
just a very minor um, change in LVEF um, is the dose that's needed to like have these big changes in, in gradient. Um, and so there are other um, uh, medications in development. Afficantin is a other uh, myosin inhibitor that's being developed. It, the phase two Redwood trial is starting to wrap up and they're rolling into their phase three uh, Sequoia trial right now. So enrollment is ongoing uh, for non-obstructive HCM um, in Redwood and for uh, obstructive HCM in Sequoia. And so it's really great to have these new options um, available. Um, and then if we think about future therapy, again, so we can think about myosin inhibitors being used for symptomatic obstructive HCM. They may also be um, useful in a disease modifying role, giving it bef uh, before um, clinically overt HCM um, develops um, to try to attenuate or reduce um, the progression um, towards HCM. Um, I think that we'll need to get a lot more um, of a feel of the safety long term um, of the myosin inhibitors before we start giving it to healthy youngsters to try to um, to uh, forestall disease. But it's um, an exciting uh, thought to think that we might be able to one of these days. Um, and there's also been um, uh, animal models that show that calcium channel blockers and angiotensin re uh, receptor blockers may also have a disease modifying role. Um, and um, in, in, in the future, which is maybe the not so distant future now, and we'll hear a little bit more about this in later talks, there might be ways to specifically target the genetic defects in HCM um, and, and try to address that primarily. So really getting to the heart of, um, of HCM. So here's a way that um, we can think about pharmacologic um, uh, uh, manipulation for disease modification. Uh, so the Simon lab, again, um, was trying to look at the early stages of HCM and how disease developed, and they saw that in early preclinical HCM in the mice, there was uh, this really exuberant upregulation and increased activity of pro-fibrotic pathways, so pathways that um, tell the heart to make scar tissue were activated early, even before uh, people uh, or the mice had developed any um, hypertrophy. Um, and so this all, uh, the, one of the central nodes of these pathways seem to be this master molecule called TGF-beta. And if TGF-beta is activated, that's a big, strong signal in the body to form scar tissue. So they've tried um, knocking down TGF-beta activation um, by giving an, an antibody that neutralized TGF-beta, and also by giving um, a very commonly used medicine called Losartan that, that can have some impact on that. And they saw that if they gave um, uh, these treatments to their HCM mice early in life before they developed LVH, they were able to decrease the amount of hypertrophy that developed and decrease the amount of fibrosis that developed. So it looked like it was truly modifying disease. It wasn't curing it, um, but it was. It seemed to be um, significantly be uh, beneficially um, modifying it. So um, we took that into the VANISH trial uh, where we tested this um, new strategy of disease modification using Valsartan and we wanted to target early stage disease because we felt that if we look, go early in disease, we had a better um, chance of being successful uh, to change um, the disease course because you might be more responsive um, to, uh, to having a medication given at that time before um, you've had um, disease set in for many, many years and, um, uh, and the changes can become entrenched. And we showed that Valsartan improved a composite or a combined outcome um, that had nine different metrics that reflected cardiac remodeling. Those individuals that were receiving um, Valsartan showed disease progression that showed that their disease progression stabilized or even improved, um, whereas those that were getting the placebo um, had um, a worsening of uh, these metrics over the two-year treatment course. We also saw that the treatment benefit was um, more pronounced in the participants that had a smaller baseline left ventricular wall thickness. So if your left ventricular hypertrophy was below the median value, um, there was a stronger um, uh, treatment benefit. And this again reinforces that disease modifying therapy may be most effective if given early in disease um, when there's less pronounced remodeling. And so this really is an exciting opportunity where we might start thinking about attenuating or trying to slow down disease progression in people with sarcomeric HCM if we give it early in life um, and, um, and this is accomplished with a widely available and well-tolerated medication. So here are my take-home points. 
Uh, genetic insights can help to improve the precision of the medicine that we deliver and hopefully start improving your outcomes. Um, we can improve diagnosis by separating larger populations into distinct subgroups, sarcomeric versus non-sarcomeric HCM, for instance. We can think about starting to individualize care. Uh, Colleen will tell you how we can use genetics to guide family management. We can also think about using it to target the right treatment to the right person at the right time. And we also want to think, most importantly, about how we might be able to prevent disease. We want to identify those individuals that are at risk and start to treat them before changes become irreversible. And starting therapy early um, may um, improve our chances of success. So thanks so much for your um, attention, and I'll be glad to answer questions um, in our Q&A session. Fantastic, Carolyn. Thank you for that comprehensive overview and the review of some of uh, the other trials that are going on uh, and how they may be impacted by the addition of genetic information on top of clinical presentation of HCM. So I do have a couple of questions before we move on. Um, actually, I'm gonna hold Esther's question for the next talk. Um, if someone was diagnosed five years ago with little or no thickening, would Valsartan potentially still work? And how long is too long to wait? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure um, if it's how long it's been since you we were diagnosed, but um, it seemed that it, the people that, um, so everybody in, in Vantage was essentially asymptomatic, had to be NYHA class one or a very you know, low class two um, to, to get in. Um, it, it really is how um, it, um, severe the, the hypertrophy is. So I think that if you've had um, a diagnosis of HEM for some period of time, but you remain asymptomatic and you don't have really severe um, hypertrophy, I think that Valsartan um, would be something to think about. Um, so, you know, unfortunately with the VH trial, we couldn't um, see whether it really impacts the outcomes that we all really care about. Does it help you live longer? Does it help you avoid getting um, symptoms? Does it help you avoid having atrial fibrillation or sudden death or heart failure? We couldn't look at that because those outcomes play out over decades, right? So we'd have to like, you know, have people sign up for a trial that is going to continue for, you know, 20 years and we'd need, you know, 10, 20, 30 times more people to really be able to answer that question. So it may be that we don't actually get to do that, um, uh, that specific trial, um, but you know, the, it did seem to have really um, exciting positive benefits on the heart. You know, the heart was slightly less thick, the heart was slightly bigger, the relaxation was better, the NT pro BNP, the biomarker levels of stress um, were better. Those things seem like they're probably good. Um, so we're having, you know, discussions with patients saying we don't really know if this will help the, the things that we care about most. It seems like it may um, help with um, how your heart it seems to be coping um, with HCM. Um, there's little downside to taking this. So if you're of the mind saying, you know, there's little um, downside, you know, um, Valsartan is incredibly um, safe and well tolerated and, and inexpensive. Uh, so if you're of the mind to say um, it might help, it probably won't hurt, um, you know, sign me up, that's great. But if you're the mindset to say, you know, you know, if you can't prove to me that it's gonna, you know, really affect those things that I care about, you know, no thanks, I don't wanna take a medication. I think either of those responses is, um, you know, completely reasonable and appropriate. And it's just kind of, um, you know, depends on what your, you know, particular um, mindset might be. Um, but it's nice to have, you know, potentially an, an, an option that will be beneficial in a way to feel empowered and you know, like you're doing something proactive. I think this is a really good explanation and example of shared decision-making. So the family working with a trusted physician who is knowledgeable in HCM can make these decisions. Do I wanna start early? Do I wanna wait for something to be more visible or a symptom to show up and then treat? And I think we all kind of have to start taking this moment in time to think about the potential of getting to a point where we're treating what we believe is going to happen due to our knowledge of genetics and disease rather than waiting for all the downstream consequences to follow. And Thanks. we're all learning together where those points are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. A lot of you are asking questions that I know are going to be addressed in our next talk. 
So I'm going to thank Carolyn for her time on that talk and we'll get back to some questions later. And we're going to ask Colleen to share her screen and start talking to us about the practical applications of genetics in HCM. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you, Lisa. And um, what are you seeing for my slides? Just the slides? I, I'm seeing just your slides. You look good to go. Fantastic, thank you. So um, my name is Colleen Kalishu. Um, I am a genetic counselor. Some of you will have met with a genetic counselor before and know what sort of beast we are, but for those who don't, um, I am an allied, or genetic counselors are allied healthcare professionals. Uh, we are not doctors, we are trained at the master's level. Uh, and we specialize in helping those physicians and patients and families to really navigate um, many different aspects of their genetic diseases. And we're gonna talk about that um, really throughout um, my part of tonight. Uh, and I started working on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, you know, as soon as I entered the field um, and uh, have seen more patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy than any other disease that I specialize in. I, I specifically care for people with inherited heart conditions. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you tonight. And I feel like uh, Dr. Ho set me up really well for the kind of more um, rubber hits the road, what do you do with genetics in your life and your family conversation that we're gonna be having. So how do you make sense of your genetic testing? Uh, you know, what is this genetic testing that people talked about that Dr. Ho mentioned and um, what can you do with it? So these, this slide shows you the different steps that happen um, in genetic testing. So the goal of genetic testing, first of all, is trying to identify whether or not you, someone with HCM has an abnormality in a sarcomere gene or one of those other more rare sort of um, mimics or cousins of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So trying to see if there's an abnormality in one of those genes in the DNA that would be the cause or explanation for someone's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which then in turn um, can give some of the insights that Dr. Ho was just sharing and also can be very helpful in taking care of the family, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. So that's what we're trying to do when we do genetic testing. And here's how that is done. So first, you know, you will provide some sort of sample that has your DNA in it. And uh, historically that has usually been blood, but increasingly it's more often um, spitting into a tube, which some of you may have done. And then that gets sent to a laboratory and the uh, DNA gets pulled out of the spit or blood and analyzed on a machine called a sequencer, which you can see a picture of here. Uh, and that's essentially reading the letters of your DNA, which I'll show you in a minute. And then the rest of the work is actually done um, partly by computers, but largely by humans, geneticists, which are scientists or physicians specialized in genetic diseases um, and genetic counselors. And that is the interpretation piece, which is actually a pretty big deal. Um, so we're gonna spend some time on that. What I mean by interpretation is from what the laboratory was able to see in your DNA, is there that abnormality in there? Can they find the cause of your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And once that interpretation step is done, then there's a report that's written up uh, that's often very technical and very hard to read. As a field, we need to do way better about this. It's not only hard for patients and families to read, it's also hard for healthcare providers who don't specialize in this to read. Um, so uh, often it's my job or other genetic counselors or physicians and nurses who specialize in HCM uh, to translate that for you. So once your DNA has been analyzed, this is actually what it looks like, believe it or not. Um, our DNA uh, basically is a lot like a recipe. Each gene is a little bit like a recipe and it has letters in it. Um, the letters actually represent um, kind of chemical building blocks in the DNA, but the way that we represent it and interpret it and make sense of it is by giving these letters, uh, G, C, T, and A, 
And the, the order of those letters, just like the order of letters in a word or a sentence, gives the body meaning. So this is a little snippet of DNA from my favorite hypertrophic cardiomyopathy gene, which is MYH7. So after your DNA gets analyzed in the genetic testing laboratory, um, the person who's interpreting it and the computer software interpreting it will be looking at uh, many, many more letters than what I've shown here. This is just a tiny little bit of a gene. And the possibilities for the interpretation are that the gene is normal, that the gene is abnormal, or that it's uncertain. And the, the language we use in genetics is that it's a normal, pardon me, normal or negative or likely pathogenic or pathogenic for abnormal or variant of uncertain significance for uncertain. So what does it actually mean to have that abnormal result? Well, you can see here in the abnormal example in the middle, um, this letter is a C, but in the normal MYH7 gene, it's a T. For the uncertain result on the right, um, this different place in the gene, uh, in the uncertain result, that letter is a G, but in the normal MYH7 gene, it's an A. So it really is, especially in this gene, often just one letter changed. Figuring out if a letter change is normal, abnormal, or certain, I didn't show this to you on the last slide, but there are letter changes that are normal. It's actually extremely challenging and it is an evolving science and art. Uh, you do not need to read these words. They are impossible to read and almost on purpose. This is a checklist of all the different things that we look for in the laboratory when we're trying to figure out if a letter difference in the MYH7 gene is a normal one or abnormal one. So we look at all these different pieces of of evidence or like red flags or suggestions that it's fine and try and put that all together. So this is very different from, is my cholesterol high or low? Yes or no. Uh, it's actually a, a very challenging process. And what it leads us to isn't a black or white yes or no. It's what you see on your screen here. And it, forgive me, there's a lot of medical mumbo jumbo here that I will walk you through in a second. But it's really the, the likelihood, the probability, the chance that this specific genetic difference, that letter change in, in a gene is one that causes disease or is one that is completely normal. So what we're doing when we're trying to go through that checklist on the prior page is we're really trying to say, are we completely confident that it's normal, which is shown here as benign on the left, medical term for normal. Are we highly confident that it's abnormal? There are a handful of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, mutations or genetic differences that we are extremely confident in, and they would be over here. But there's a lot of genetic test results that end up in this middle place of variant of uncertain significance where we, we're trying to weigh the chance it's normal, the chance it's abnormal, and we really can't figure out which one wins out. In addition, this really changes a lot over time or has been changing over time, especially the past decade. So your genetic test results can actually change. So these are examples of real genetic test reports of patients that I've seen, there's no private information here, where the laboratory previously said it was normal and years later they said, no, it's abnormal or the other way around, or it was uncertain, but wait, no, now we think it's normal. Many patients and even physicians are not aware that genetic test results can change. Um, it's important that you get your genetic testing looked at again. It's not that the thing in your DNA is going away or getting better or being spelled, you know, the spell checker is fixing the spelling. It's still there in your DNA. It's that checklist and balance of chance that it's normal, chance that it's abnormal as our knowledge about these genes changes. So the bottom line about genetic testing, if you get an abnormal result, that is something that can be helpful for you um, and your family. Uh, the terms you'll see on your report for abnormal are pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Uh, we're gonna talk in a minute about how it can be helpful for your family. And Dr. Ho has already showed you some ways that it can be helpful for you. If you get an uncertain result, ignore it for now. It doesn't provide any information. 
if you get a normal or negative result, it also is kind of a dead end. It doesn't help us with the exception that it gives you that little bit of reassurance from what Dr. Ho was sharing that your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on average may be more mild than somebody who got an abnormal result. And importantly, if you get a normal or negative genetic test result and you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, your family members can still develop hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That doesn't prove it's not running in the family. That is a very open and important question that um, smart scientists are trying to figure out. Um, you know, so many of us who see families like yours, we want to be able to tell you, you don't have to worry about your kids. You know, you don't have to worry about your sister. Or if you're someone who has got the family history that you don't have to worry about yourself. The other bottom line is if you have old genetic test results, even more than even five years old, definitely more than that, they need to be looked at again by a genetics expert because the result may have changed. The interpretation may have changed. So how do we use genetic testing to take care of the whole family? And when genetic testing can't help us because the result was uncertain or normal, how do we take care of the whole family? So this is one of the first patients that I ever took care of with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He came to me because he was concerned about his children developing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, he had it, he'd had to undergo myectomy and he had lost a cousin, pardon me, uncles um, to sudden death at a young age. Uh, as we um, started taking care of the family and finding out more information, it turned out that he had two siblings with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a niece with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which means the niece's mother also has it in her genes. However, there were several other people in the family who had normal echocardiograms. So at this time, they did not have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As you all know, that only tells us about their heart right now. It doesn't tell us about their future. And they wanted to know about the future. So we did, uh, before I jump onto genetic testing. So what do we do the family, with the family at this stage? Well, at this stage, we do something called family screening, which is just kind of the lingo we use in genetics to say that certain family members need to proactively go in and get echoes and EKGs and meet with a cardiologist, potentially other tests, depending on the specific situation. And they need to keep doing it because HCM develops over time as Dr. Ho showed us. So these are the people who are kind of in these uh, red squares and rectangles in this family tree. These are the people who need to um, be getting their hearts checked so that HCM can be found as soon as it starts. And we actually give written recommendations based on expert guidance about how often and which family members and what heart tests. So this family pursued genetic testing because they wanted to be able to know whether or not their children inherited it. And we did find uh, a spelling difference, a genetic difference in a sarcomere gene. It was first considered an uncertain result. And over time, we were able to work with the laboratory um, to uh, determine that it was actually an abnormal result. And we did that by um, testing the other family members who we know have uh, the abnormality for HCM in their DNA. So we could make sure that it matched up who had HCM and who had this genetic difference. Uh, there was also other information that helped us um, with the laboratory to determine that this was the cause of their HCM, very likely. Likely enough, I told you it's all a probability, but it was likely enough that we felt comfortable that we could test the healthy individuals to see whether or not they were at risk to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, so this patient um, decided to test uh, his uh, two older children. Um, he did not test uh, his um, baby. And fortunately, his two older sons uh, tested negative. This means that they very likely did not inherit the risk to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And they don't need to keep getting their hearts tested. Um, however, since they have decided not to test the baby yet, uh, when he is old enough, he will need to get his heart tested or at that time they may choose to get genetic testing. What about other people in the family? So his sister, um, whose daughter over on the lower left here has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, she tested her children and one of her children did not inherit HCM, so no longer needs to get heart testing. And one of them did inherit HCM, so just needs to continue getting heart testing. And we might actually add some additional um, tests 
And depending on where we move with the treatments that Dr. Ho was discussing, you know, is there time gonna come where we could actually give her something to slow down or prevent the development of disease? The patient's brother um, uh, made a choice not to get genetic testing. Uh, and since he hasn't gotten genetic testing and he has a chance of having this in his DNA, a 50% chance of having it in his DNA, he needs to continue to get his heart checked. So I wanna talk with you a little bit about genetic counseling. Um, since many people are not familiar with genetic counseling and how it can potentially help you and your family. And when I say genetic counseling, what I mean by that is an appointment or a few with a genetic counselor like me, who is specialized in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and helping families uh, figure out um, how to handle having this genetic disease in their family. So I've listed here some of the most common questions and concerns that people bring when they speak with a genetic counselor. And this is the kind of thing that someone like me can help your family with. You know, why do I have HCM? Will my kids get it too? Um, how do I take care of my child who inherited HCM from me? Uh, in terms of worries, um, a counselor is in our job title. We are not psychotherapists, but we do have training and expertise in helping with the more stressful and personal and emotional and family dynamic aspects of having something like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in your family. And that includes things like, I'm scared I'm gonna need a heart transplant like my sister. Um, my uh, brother died suddenly and I have so much fear of that happening to my children. Um, we're worried about whether or not we should, our children should get genetic testing and what, how will that affect their ability to get insurance? So these are the kinds of things that um, a genetic counselor can help you with. Genetic counseling is recommended by multiple um, sort of expert groups of doctors who make recommendations for how to take care of patients with genetic heart diseases. So organizations like the American Heart Association or the Heart Failure Society of America or the European Society of Cardiology have all uh, made recommendations that patients and families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should get genetic counseling. And here's um, just a few of the things um, that we found in research studies can happen um, to benefit patients and their families um, from seeing a genetic counselor. So family histories can be very important in making a diagnosis and management, drawing out that pedigree, that family tree I showed you, that tends to be more accurate and thorough if it's done by a genetic counselor. Um, more patients are more likely to be able to get the genetic testing that they need and avoid genetic testing they don't need if they see a genetic counselor. Patients actually um, are more likely to do what their doctor recommends for their treatment if, if they get genetic counseling. Um, and there's also uh, psychological or family and personal benefits like um, making a more informed choice about genetic testing, feeling less anxiety or distress about your disease um, and feeling uh, more engaged and well taken care of. So how do you find a genetic counselor? Uh, well, you will not be surprised to hear me say that an HCMA uh, recognized uh, center of excellence is a great place to start. Um, if that's something you don't have access to, um, there are other ways to get uh, genetic counseling. At the beginning of tonight, Lisa was talking about genetic testing being available no cost through several laboratories. Um, several laboratories, the same laboratories, also provide genetic counseling no cost to individuals who got genetic testing with them. So if you had genetic testing with a laboratory in the past and you haven't had genetic counseling, one option is you call that laboratory up and say, I had genetic testing with you, I'd like to get genetic counseling. Another possibility is um, we all know after the pandemic, so many of our medical appointments are happening like this over Zoom or over the phone. And that's true for genetic counseling as well. So you may live far from a center of excellence or you know, other university hospital that has genetic counselors in their cardiology department, but they may be able to still see you um, remotely. And the National Society of Genetic Counselors has this website, findageneticcounselor.org, and you can actually specify to search by telehealth and expertise in cardiology. And lastly, um, there are a handful of companies, including one that I work, out, work at, full disclosure, 
uh, that provide genetic counseling remotely across the country. And at many of these companies, you can just go to the website and request an appointment. Um, for some of them, they will build out to your insurance. For some others, um, you will have to pay um, an out-of-pocket fee. So lots of ways you can get help from a genetic counselor, including in what we talked about regarding looking at old genetic test results and seeing whether or not anything important has changed with them that would change your care or care for your family. Um, so I just want to thank some of the people that I've um, worked on this stuff with in the past, uh, the other cardiac genetic counselors at Genome Medical where I work, um, a great crew of cardiovascular genetic counselor clinician scientists from across the country in the middle there. And then until a few years ago, I was at the Stanford Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Disease. And on the right are the genetic counselors, nurses, and cardiologists um, who were my work family there. Thank you, Colleen. That was very informative. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of the questions that were asked that were probably addressed, but we're just gonna make sure we're clarifying yeah. these points to people. Um, how can you tell if you have a sarcomeric gene mutation? I'm gonna add that word. Get genetic testing that includes the sarcomere genes, and that will tell you whether or not you have an abnormality or mutation in the sarcomere gene. Does MYBPC classify as a sarcomere mutation? It absolutely does. Um, I went a little too into MYH7 because it's my favorite, but uh, most the MYH7 and MYBPC3 are two sarcomere genes that make up the largest chunk of sarcomere um, abnormalities in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So can you briefly speak about I'm going to read the question as it's written. Embryo screening for HCM mm -hmm. is infeasible. Is it done? So we call that PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnostics. Can you spend 30 seconds on it? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, you know, there's only so much you can do in a talk like this. And there's a lot of things like that I didn't get into. So uh, there are absolutely people who do not want to pass on the risk of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to their children. There are a variety of ways to avoid or reduce the risk of passing that on, though many of them have gotten more complicated um, with the Supreme Court uh, decision regarding abortion that can even affect embryogenetic testing way beyond our conversation today. But the specific thing this person asked about is you can do in vitro fertilization. So for those of you who don't know what IVF is, um, you take the egg and the sperm together in the laboratory to join them um, instead of doing so in the body to make embryos, which are the, you know, the very first stage after a sperm and egg get together. And you make several of those embryos at a time. And then you do genetic testing on the embryos for the abnormality that causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in that family so that uh, that couple can proceed with pregnancy with an embryo that did not inherit um, the abnormality that causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Super quick, it sounds simple and great. It's complicated and expensive and doesn't always work. So having a thorough conversation with a few different healthcare providers, including a cardiac genetic counselor, a PGD genetic counselor who does this embryo genetic testing and a reproductive endocrinologist, which is the physician that would manage all of the IVF um, before deciding is really important. So that was not part of the topic. So thank you for going a tad bit off topic and having that conversation. And I do think in a future um, session, we're gonna take a deeper dive into PGD, its implications in current times. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn that in some states, if they really practice what they preached, um, IVF and PGD would, would not be being done in certain states right now because the belief is that uh, life begins at conception for some states. And it's already happening. There are IVF clinics that are closed. Yeah. So we have- That's a whole other webinar. That's a whole other <laughs> webinar. And-, and that's going down a rabbit hole that we must go down, but we're not going to go down tonight. Um, how far back in a family tree should you go for genetic testing? Mm. So whether it's back or over or down, in other words, grandparents or siblings, aunts, uncles, 
or children, you do it in a stepwise fashion. So for example, a 18 year old gets diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The genetic testing shows the cause. There's an abnormality in the MYBPC3 gene. We now have the option for other family members to find out whether it's also in their genes. You start, you can test their siblings and if it's someone who has children, you can test their children. But in terms of going back into older generations, you start with the parents because it came from in the vast majority of HCM families, might be some of you who are exceptions, it came from one parent, not both. So you don't need to worry about dad and dad's family if we know it came from mom. So you step to mom and then, and this is actually called cascade testing because of the way you, you step based on the prior results. Um, so then you can test mom's siblings and if living mom's parents. So you keep going through the family tree like that. And you know, one of the things we do as genetic counselors is people usually come to us and they're really thinking about their closest relatives. And a big part of our job is to make sure that those distant relatives, those cousins who you don't talk to, or you know, maybe your mom's dead and you're not really in touch with her siblings anymore, we got to figure out how to get them informed so that we can hopefully do things like prevent sudden death and those people who don't know they have HCM. And that's something we got to all work together on. Amen. One last question, and then we're going to get to Dr. Farhan Ahmad, and we're going to talk about future stuff. Um, if a child, uh, oh, okay, so Rosemary, you're asking a good question, but we're going to reorganize it. Once a child has a negative genetic report for the family mutation, should they get tested again, and I will add on to her question, how often should the person who's diagnosed with a gene mutation speak to their care team about the current knowledge of that mutation? Okay, so to contextualize this, the genetic, well, there's sort of a, do we retest the child's genes? Do we retest the child's heart? Do we retest the, let's say, parent who has HCM who was found to have the abnormality? Those are all things we need to think about. And honestly, our understanding of that has evolved over the years and probably will continue to. So I'm gonna start actually with Lisa's question because it's kind of where it all starts. So the, the family member who was diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy went in and got genetic testing. The genetic test results said, this is abnormal. This is the cause you can now test your kids. I personally advise that every time you see your HCM, I should say that once a year, because some of you see, need to see your doctors a lot more often than that for your standard annual visit with your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy doctor, you ask. Things rarely change that fast, but that way it's just an anchored routine part of your regular care. So, because that parent might go in and the doctor might say, oh, they don't think this is abnormal anymore. Ah, that changes everything. I've had the, tons of these conversations, probably so as every provider on this call. We need to start echoing your kids again. Ooh, that is a hard thing to go through. So that's the one thing. And then in the kiddo, let's say that we're very confident in the abnormality that is the cause, the mutation that is the cause in the family. And we continue to be content, confident you don't need to retest the kids' genes. Their genes aren't gonna change. The interpretation of the parent's result might change like we just discussed, but you don't need to retest the kids' genes. Sometimes something happens in the family that makes you think, oh, maybe there's more going on here. That's a very small minority of families. Um, and then the last one that I may have tacked onto this or maybe you were after this is, do you keep getting the kids' hearts checked? It's actually some fascinating research that just came out by a group of cardiac genetic counselors in Canada. There are lots of families who keep getting their kids heart tests even after they've had reassuring genetic testing. We've also seen this in colon cancer, heredit hereditary colon cancer, because you're scared. Maybe you lost a child suddenly. Sure, you can tell me the genetic testing is good news, but there's no way I'm stopping echoing my kids. I get that psychologically, I definitely get that. Um, it's all about finding the right balance. Um, many centers of excellence moved away from never echo your kids again to more of a, you got a good genetic test result at five years old and the echo was normal then and we think they didn't inherit it. Bring them back at 13. Share decision-making. I would just add to all of those fantastic comments 
that we are learning more about mutations and we are learning more about um, modifier genes and other things that are going on genetically. So to keep the conversation going and have it evolve naturally over time and have it be part of your conversation, you go over your blood work, you know, what, what is my, you know, blood sugar, what is my, you know, BNP, what are my biomarkers? Kind of think of genetics in the same mm-hmm. thing. Change. Where are we going? I have a number of families who have HM on both sides of the family tree. Yeah. So your one in a million was one in 200. So it happens. Yeah. So it does happen. We used to think it was way more common. We used to think it was like 7% of cases or more. Uh, recent reanalyses suggest it's more like 1% of HCM cases, but 1% of a, a not so rare disease is a lot of families. So, and the, the I'm, I will stop and we will move on. But the modifiers question, there are tests coming. There's been some really interesting papers where we could actually, you know, here's the big culprit. Here's the MYH7 mutation that caused your HCM. But why is it worse in you than it is in your sister? Or why does your mom have it in her genes and her heart's normal at 88? We're now figuring out how to look at the rest of your DNA and find how hundreds of spots in your genome actually contribute to that. And I am hopeful So that is a test that will actually be available and we'll be able to answer questions like, okay, my kid inherited it, but how likely is it they'll actually develop it? Or, hey, I have it. Am I more likely to be of a mild case or a severe case? We're not there yet, but there's a good reason to think it's coming. Thank you very much. And there are some other questions, but we're gonna hold them until the end. Um, And any of our faculty is welcome to answer questions uh, in the Q&A chat as well. So we are now going to go a little futuristic. And Dr. Ahmad is going to talk to us about genetics in the future. And this is kind of where we're all excited to see where things are going. So you can share your screen and we can get you started. There we go. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, We're not in present mode yet. Am I in, which mode am I in? Oh, actually, let me. You guys swap swap your screens. Okay, are we good now? Beautiful, I'm shutting up. Okay, excellent. I was gonna say, uh, you you don't really like me because you assigned me a topic, uh, which is basically predicting the future, which we all know is a fool's errand, right? Uh, But I'm gonna do my best. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, I'm an um, associate professor at the University of Iowa. I'm a, a physician scientist, so I wear about six different hats, but two of the hats are I'm a cardiologist who looks after patients with HCM and a few other inherited heart disorders, and I'm a scientist um, that studies HCM uh, and some other cardiomyopathies in uh, in patients, but also in uh, various animal models, including uh, mice and pigs. Um, just to let you know, I do have some relationships with industry, including with uh, BMS that makes Mavacampton um, and Avanti Bio, which is a gene therapy company. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any work I have done or I am doing with them. So let's get started. Um, when I talk to a, a general, audience like this, um, often I spend a couple of minutes making them instant cardiologists. Uh, but today I'm not doing that because it's a genetics talk. So I, in the next two minutes, I'm going to make you all into great molecular geneticists. And actually, uh, Caroline and, and Colleen have kind of set me up for a lot of this already. Um, so as, as I think you all know, um, you've got DNA that sits in every single cell. It's called the DNA or genome, uh, which is made up of DNA. And I I call it basically the book of life. So it sits in this little bag in every cell in your body that's called the nucleus. And if the DNA is the book of life, then it's actually divided up into chapters that are called genes. And each of these chapters codes for a protein um, that has some sort of function in in the cell and in the body. and the, um, the language uh, is actually a pretty simple language. It's made about just four letters that Colleen talked about, A, C, G, and T. And it's even simpler because the words are all made up of just three letters. And each three letter word or codon is the sort of the scientific name, codes for a specific amino acid. 
which is basically a brick or, or, or a, a, a subunit. And that if you combine all these different amino acids together, it makes a protein. Um, so the DNA is sitting in this nucleus, this little bag inside the cell. And for, there's a process called transcription where you make a carbon copy of that piece of DNA, that gene, that's called the messenger RNA. And then that messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and goes into the main part of the cell where a process occurs called translation. And what that involves is that you've got these little, little molecules called transfer RNAs that have uh, the, the three letter word uh, that is specific for an amino acid. And they actually have the amino acid sitting there and they kind of line up on this carbon copy and say, oh, here we've got you know, these three letters that's coding for my amino acid. So I'm gonna come and, and lie down here. And then the next uh, transfer RNA does the same. And so over time, all these amino acids get linked together and form this, this, this chain, which is a, a protein. The other um, little concept I want to introduce to you is uh, in exons and introns. And this will become important when I talk about some uh, novel forms of therapy. So the DNA, um, the genome that you all have is actually uh, divided up into areas that actually code for proteins, uh, but they're also interspersed with uh, areas that don't code for anything. Um, and they're called introns that are sitting in between the exons. And so when the, uh, the, the carbon copy, the, the messenger RNA is made, it actually includes both the exons and the introns. And then there's a process called splicing where the introns are, are taken out. And then that mature messenger RNA or mature carbon copy of the gene uh, is then what's responsible for making the protein through translation. And Colleen's talked a little bit about you know, the different sort of typographical errors you can get in the DNA in the, in the different genes. Um, you know, uh, if this is the original sentence in English, the gray cat ran down the hall, uh, you can get different changes, including a misspelling of a single letter, and then the sentence becomes the gray cat ran down the ball, which doesn't make much sense. Uh, you can get an insertion where you get an extra word or extra letters put in, in this case, the gray green cat ran down the hall, which again, doesn't make total sense. Uh, you can get a deletion of some letters. So in this case, it becomes the gray ran down the hall. Again, it makes no sense. Um, or you can get a duplication of letters, uh, the gray cat cat down, ran down the hall. Or you could get something where, where the sentence is just truncated, uh, the gray, period. So what happens is that you know, if you've got a normal gene, you'll get a nice normal protein. But if you've got one of these kinds of um, variants or mutations, um, then either the protein that is formed by that mutated gene is abnormal and doesn't function right, or it actually doesn't get produced at all. So you may get no protein at all. All right, so with that background, um, I'm going to talk to you about four emerging uh, genetic technologies that can be used for as therapeutic um, strategies in inherit various inherited disorders, but specifically in HCM. So I'm going to go over these all in, in detail, but uh, the four strategies are one is gene replacement or, or gene therapy. And um, Eric is going to talk much more about this, but you basically um, uh, just over it, you introduce a sort of a new normal gene into the cell and it just produces a lot of extra normal protein. Uh, you can actually silence uh, the abnormal gene. And you know, in most cases, we inherit two copies of every gene or, or what are called two alleles, one from our mom and one from a dad. And uh, you can actually silence the abnormal allele, but let the normal allele or normal gene continue its work. And that's a way of potentially you know, preventing disease. Uh, you can do something called exon skipping, and we'll, we'll talk what that is uh, a little later, or sort of what I call the holy grail, which is genome editing, where you actually fix the change that the abnormality in the DNA itself. Um, so those are all four techniques that we'll go through in, in some detail. Now, there's different machineries that you use to, to do any of these types of um, uh, approaches. Um, and often they're, they're pieces of DNA or pieces of RNA or uh, other, other small molecules that you use to, to, um, uh, to make these therapeutic changes. And um, you can actually just have some raw DNA just sitting there uh, naked that you could use. You can package your, your um, therapeutic molecule in a virus. A couple of the viruses that have been used more commonly are adenoviral 
uh, adenoviruses. Um, they are, they're good. Um, they're pretty easy to use and they're pretty big and you can package big, big tools inside them. Uh, the problem is that they're actually very common in the population. They're, they cause colds and they're a pretty common cold virus. And so a lot of us have antibodies to it. And so if you give it to somebody, chances are they have an antibody that's gonna kind of kill the virus before it does anything. Um, uh, a newer uh, uh, sort of technique is to use something called adeno-associated viral vectors. Uh, they're smaller uh, viruses, uh, so they can't use as big tools in there, but they're actually um, less, um, they, they stimulate the immune system less and they're probably more useful. And there's uh, different types of these, these uh, AAV vectors and uh, some of them sort of are, are, have a special predilection or, or, uh, for certain cells or certain tissues that some of them like heart cells more, some of them like liver cells more. So that can be a useful um, way to sort of um, target the virus to a specific tissue. Now you can give this kind of virus, uh, you know, just in the bloodstream intravenously, it'll go everywhere in the body, or you can actually try to target it more by, uh, for example, injecting it into the arteries and veins that um, feed the muscle of the heart, since, you know, you're, in this case, we're going to treat uh, HCM. Uh, another approach is actually to inject the virus directly into the muscle of the heart itself. And so these are different sort of techniques that can be used. All right, um, so let's go on now and uh, talk about our four different strategies. Um, I'll spell, I'm actually just going to be basically uh, setting up uh, Dr. Adler for his talk with this, this part of my, my discussion. Uh, but one option is gene replacement, where you um, have two copies of the gene, you know, one from mom and one from dad. And so let's say this is the abnormal gene um, that was producing an abnormal uh, RNA or abnormal car uh, carbon copy and then an abnormal protein. Uh, but uh, you can actually just uh, introduce a new normal gene uh, through a virus that will go into the cell and will produce the normal carbon copy and a normal protein. And you're not getting rid of the abnormal protein, but if you produce enough of the normal protein, you kind of overwhelm the system and the small amount of abnormal protein doesn't make a difference anymore. And, and, and you know, the disease is actually curtailed. Um, so this, this strategy has been used uh, in uh, model systems. Um, and so this particular study was done in mice that have HCM because they have a mutation in uh, mice and binding protein C3, which is one of the uh, two most commonly involved genes in HCM. And I think Colleen was saying that was her favorite gene, if I remember. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, what they did is that they packaged a normal copy of the gene into a virus and they introduced it into these mice. And this is something um, called Northern blot. But what they did is that they, they took these different mice and they injected uh, different amounts of the virus. And so this is actually a normal mouse. Um, and this is a, an abnormal mouse with HCM, but they didn't, do, they didn't inject any virus. And then in the next several lanes here, they injected larger and larger amounts of virus. And you can see that more and more of the normal extra gene from outside from the virus was being expressed. Also um, down here, these little bands down here, um, these represent mutated um, RNA, uh, so mutant copies of the, of the gene that are abnormal and that are causing HCM. And you can see as you give more and more of the normal virus, the mutated uh, amount gets less and less proportionally. And this is just, you know, these are graphs that kind of just show the same thing. And, and this is happening at the protein level too. So this is RNA, this is the carbon copy of the gene but this is the actual protein that's produced by the RNA. And so if you don't inject um, any, any virus um, into the HCM mouse, you're not getting much uh, expression of that normal protein. But if you inject virus, you're getting much more expression of the normal protein. It's, it's not quite like a normal mouse, but getting close. And so what does that mean? So they, they actually did echocardiograms in these mice. And uh, they, they injected the, uh, the virus very early on, you know, basically newborn mice. And then they did echocardiograms uh, at two weeks of age. And uh, this is a normal mouse here. This is a, a mouse with HCM where they injected no virus. And then here are mice where they injected more and more of the virus. And you can see as um, you give more and more of the virus and, and sort of overexpress more and more normal protein, um, the mass of the heart, the, the, the degree of hypertrophy in the heart went down. So 
In fact, at the end over here, you know, these mice had almost the same heart mass as, as normal mice. And this, this effect persisted. So this is um, early, this is two weeks. So th these mice were still basically kids. Uh, these are mice at 34 weeks of age, which is kind of like middle age for mice. And you can see that that same effect still persisted into middle age. And we saw something similar in, uh, in sort of a human model. So these are um, heart muscle cells from humans. They're not actually really from the heart. They're actually engineered uh, heart muscle cells, but they're, they were taken from patients that either didn't have HCM or had HCM. And um, if you just look at these rows here, this is, a, this is a, an, an image of a, a, a heart muscle cell from a, uh, a person who does not have HCM. This is a, one, a picture here of somebody who has HCM. And you can see that there's a difference in size. The, uh, the person with HCM has a bigger heart muscle cell. And they then injected uh, a virus that had a lot of normal gene um, and uh, the heart muscle uh, cell decreased in size. Uh, and this is shown here graphically. So these are just uh, uh, heart muscle cells from, from people without HCM, uh, either just at baseline or after injection of the virus. The virus didn't do anything because these, these people had no HCM. These were people uh, with HCM and they had a much higher uh, bigger heart muscle cell size. And then when they got, these cells got injected with this virus uh, that had the normal gene, uh, there was a decrease in size in the heart muscle cell. So this suggests that what we're seeing in mice might also work in people. And there are some clinical trials underway, not directly in HCM, uh, but in other kinds of heart disease that kind of look like HCM, including uh, Friedrich's ataxia and then Dannon disease, which is what, um, Dr. Adler is going to talk much more about. So I'm going to leave it there. So that's, that's one approach. A second approach is uh, what's called allele-specific silencing. So you've got um, two copies of every gene, you know, one from your mom and one from your dad. And uh, in this case, you know, this, this uh, individual has one normal healthy gene that's producing normal protein. But then this other gene is abnormal. It has a variant that can cause disease. And so it's producing an RNA or carbon copy that's abnormal, and then ultimately a protein that's abnormal. What you can do is with various techniques, you can actually inhibit the, um, the production of the abnormal RNA and then the abnormal protein. So you basically just obliterate or erase the abnormal protein and let the normal gene still do its work. And sometimes that's sufficient to cure the disease. And uh, so one of the technologies that's in use is something called RNA interference. And in this case, you've got um, little uh, molecules called siRNAs. And uh, when they go into the cell, they, they're gonna process by this protein called dicer. And then they, they get complex with some other proteins. And this protein siRNA complex uh, is very specific for a sequence that you're interested in. So you actually design the siRNA to have a sequence that matches the area that you want to inhibit. So if you know that, okay, this is an, uh, a gene and a mRNA that has a mutation that is causing HCM, I'm gonna design my siRNA to target that. And it'll go and bind to that mutant um, uh, messenger RNA and, and basically destroy it uh, or prevent it from being translated into a protein. And so by that method, Again, you're just basically inhibiting the abnormal gene from being expressed. The other copy of the gene, the other allele, is still going to work normally. And so you'll still end up getting normal protein. You just uh, don't have the abnormal protein around anymore. And sometimes, depending on the gene and depending on the disease, um, that may actually be sufficient to cure the problem. And so, in fact, this has been, again, uh, done in, uh, in mice, in mouse models. This is a mouse model with uh, a human mutation in mice and heavy chain six. And um, in this group, actually from the Seidman lab, um, they, uh, this was a mouse here uh, with HCM. And you can see it's a pretty thick heart muscle. And this blue here, that represents scar tissue, which is very common in HCM. And so these mice got injected uh, with an approach that it inhibited the abnormal gene, but let the normal gene work its way. Uh, and you can see that the heart muscle was not quite as thick anymore. 
and you didn't see that blue uh, anymore. So that scarring went away. And in fact, if you, you know, blow up those pictures and look at it, look at the tissue under the microscope, this is a, a mice that was not treated. Um, you've got the heart muscle cells that are very disorganized. You've got little, this, this pink here represents scar tissue and all that goes away. This, you know, when, when the mice were treated with this gene silencing approach, um, you know, the, the, the scarring went away and the heart muscle looked much, much more normal. So it definitely works in mice. And uh, again, I, you know, looking for sort of human correlates, uh, this approach has not yet, you know, reached prime time for HCM in, in people yet, but this technique is actually being used in human patients and being used clinically. Um, there is a drug uh, called Pertisuran that is being used in uh, patients that have um, amyloidosis. So some people with amyloidosis have an abnormal gene uh, called TTR. And uh, TTR codes for a protein that's in, involved in, in the thyroid hormone function. But when it's abnormal, it clumps up and it can get deposited in the heart muscle and the heart gets real thick. So you know it kind of looks a little bit like HCM. And uh, this drug is FDA approved. It actually uh, is basically based on the siRNA technology that I, I mentioned. It will then uh, target the, um, the messenger RNA for, for TTR and inhibit its translation into protein. So you get much less expression of the protein that clumps up and that actually helps prevent the progression of amyloidosis in the heart and also in other tissues like the nerves. So this is again precedent, um, even though it's not HCM, it is certainly precedent and proof of principle that it can be used, this technique or this technology can be used effectively in, in human patients. All right, let's go on to exon skipping. Um, so in this case, I told you before, if you remember, that genes are made up of exons and introns. And um, in this case, this is a mouse that has a mutation or genetic variant uh, in exon six of, of the MYBBC3 gene. Um, in this, uh, this strategy, um, the uh, investigators used a method that basically forced, when the, when the gene was being transcribed into RNA, um, it forced the removal of exon five and six, uh, and exon six actually has that mutation. So that the, the final uh, carbon copy that was made was lacking exons five and six. So you went from exon three to four to seven to eight. And so the protein that's formed is a little bit short. It doesn't contain the amino acids that exons five and six code for. So it's not quite a normal protein, but it actually sometimes, and depending on the gene and the protein, that, that protein can still work pretty well and, and the patient may not have disease. And so this approach again was used in mice uh, newborn mice with a uh, mutation in MYBBC3 were given this exon skipping machinery and um, echocardiograms were, were performed. And, and so these are mice that are just normal without a mutation. These are mice with the mutation who did not get the treatment. These are mice who actually got the treatment. And um, uh, when the echocardiograms were done, this is the mass of the, of the heart, uh, untreated mice, and this is the mass in the treated mice. And you can see that the mass went way down, almost to the normal levels. So it's very, very effective in this mouse model. And again, we haven't used this technique yet in humans uh, with HCM, but uh, uh, this, this type of technique is being used now in, in patients with, uh, with muscular dystrophy. Uh, which also affects the heart. And so these are actually boys with um, muscular dystrophy uh, and uh, they have uh, uh, almost no normal uh, dystrophin, which is the protein that is expressed uh, by that abnormal gene. They have almost no normal protein in their, in their skull muscle or probably in their heart muscle either. Um, so they were given this exon uh, skipping technology. These are all patients that have variants in exon 53 in the gene. And uh, that exon was skipped. Uh, and uh, with the skipping, they actually got more of the normal gene. They didn't get back to 100% level. The best patient got up to 10% of the normal level of, of, of dystrophin in, in his skeletal muscle, but that was sufficient to cause some improvement clinically. And so just on the basis of this data, the FDA actually approved it on an accelerated basis uh, with the proviso that the company has to do a lot more studies clinically to prove that you know, it works long-term. 
Okay, let's finish up with something called genome editing. So this is intellectually very interesting because you can actually go into the DNA, into the patient's genome and fix the problem, actually fix the abnormality that's there in the genome, and fix the typographical errors, like taking some uh, liquid paper, erasing out the uh, abnormal letter and putting in the new letter. Um, so there are a number of different technologies that are used for that. Uh, one of the more common and uh, widely used ones is CRISPR-Cas9. So in this case, you got uh, this protein called Cas9, and it's coupled with uh, an, uh, something called a guide RNA that has a specific sequence that tells the Cas9 to go to sequence of interest. So if you know you've got a mutation sitting right here, you make the guide RNA uh, have a sequence that will fit it. And so what happens is that when, when the Cas9 goes there, it actually breaks up the DNA. It causes a break in the DNA. Now, the cell does not like broken DNA, so it'll try to fix it, and it'll try to put the two pieces back together. But you can also give the cell uh, a normal um, a template, basically, with a normal uh, sequence for that gene, and then the cell is going to use that template with the normal sequence to repair that break, and it'll put in the normal uh, version of the gene instead of the abnormal gene. And so you can actually fix the DNA problem that way. Now, there's two kind of ways you can do it. One is um, to do it in, you know, in, in cells like uh, you know, sperms or eggs or, or, or in embryos. Um, multiple potential issues there. One is that this technology is not perfect and it can cause errors elsewhere in the DNA. And if you do that, you're going to introduce it into a person and that person can pass on these abnormalities into future children. Um, there are potentially ethical issues. Uh, in fact, somebody did try this a few years ago, not for HCM, but for something else. And uh, he ended up in, in prison for three years. He just got out of jail. Uh, so not necessarily the best way to go about things. Uh, but what you can do is introduce that technology just into specific cells that have the disease process. So you can introduce it specifically into heart muscle cells and just fix the heart muscle cells. And this has actually been done again in, um, in mouse models. This is actually a mouse model, not of HCM, but of muscular dystrophy. And uh, they did this where, you know, this is a, just a normal mouse. This is a mouse with muscular dystrophy and, and uh, its heart is just totally abnormal. It has um, abnormal muscle cells, it has scarring. And when uh, the, the mouse was treated with this genome editing, then um, basically the heart became more or less normal again, uh, both you know, at the tissue level. And if you look at the muscle, um, the strength of the muscle, this is the muscle of a, 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 a mouse that has muscular dystrophy. And this is one that was treated and that mouse was able to generate better force uh, in, in its skeletal muscle. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, basically, again, just to review, um, I told you about four different technologies that are sort of at different levels. Uh, they're coming forward and some of them are being used in humans. Certainly the first three approaches are being used in humans. Um, not so much in HCM yet, but the, you know, the day will come where probably some of these techniques will be used in human patients. And then genome editing um, is probably it's a little scarier uh, and there's a lot more sort of troubleshooting that has to be done, but uh, potentially this is a technique that could be used, uh, maybe not in, in sort of people as a whole and whole body, but maybe in specific tissues and, and specific organs. And so I'm gonna stop there. Our heads are gonna explode. It's also technical yeah. and also interesting. I tried to make it as little technical as possible, but it, it was a technical topic. It is a technical talk and we have some technical questions coming in, some specifically related and some more general. I'm gonna to try to stick with the questions that are specific at this point. So if you have a specific question to this talk, please post it now, or we will wait for some of these other questions until after the next talk. Um, so one of the questions is, and it is an unanswerable question, I will start it as that. Um, it is your opinion. How many years from FDA approval is pediatric gene modifying drug, I will say, or other methodology for HCM? How far out is it? How far out is it? Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, that, that is a totally... Um, 
unanswerable question. Um, the, 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 the neuromuscular field is a little bit ahead of us in, in cardiology. Um, so they have actually started using these techniques. I, I actually showed a little bit of you know, what's been happening in, in muscular dystrophy. Um, but you know, it's fine, they're, they're the trailblazers and um, you know, uh, we can piggyback on them. So I don't know, you and I had that conversation like a week ago, Lisa, and I, uh, I don't know, uh, I was saying it, it may be a decade or two. It may not, it, it may be faster than that. Um, uh, especially, you know, some of the techniques that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I think are a little bit more mature. I think genome editing will, has its issues and, and that may be further behind, but uh, exon skipping or other, other um, gene silencing potentially might, uh, might be amenable uh, much earlier. Maybe we're talking half a decade or a decade. Now, there, the technology is a little bit dependent on the type of gene and the type, the mechanism of disease. So there are certain genes like myosin binding protein C3, for example, that work a little bit different than some of the other genes. And so in some cases, if you just get rid of an abnormal gene, that might not fix the, the HCM uh, because you actually need the full two copies of the gene for you to have a normal heart. For other genes, it may be fine just to you know, do use the gene silencing approach, get rid of one, the abnormal gene, and the normal gene, even though it's just one copy, that might be enough to have a normal heart. So it's going to still be, I mean, all these techniques are very designer, um, and it's not going to be one size fit all. You actually have to, almost all of these are, are, you have to figure out what the genetic variant is, what the gene is, and then uh, use a strategy that's appropriate for that person. And in some cases, you actually have to design the, the so-called drug for that specific person with that specific variant. Not for all these techniques, but for many of them. So it's it's complicated. Um, but I mean, there is hope. I, I, I think, you know, certainly in our lifetime, we're gonna see a lot of these techniques move forward into the clinical realm. So we're going to see a true demonstration with Dr. Adler's presentation coming up next. Hint, hint, Eric, get on camera. Um, <laughs> And we are going to uh, take a dive there. We have some other general questions that we're gonna hold till after this talk and we will get to all of your questions. So there we go. Eric's got his slides, get us into present mode and we'll be good to go. Oh, he's got a Mac, <laughs> I can tell. And da, 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 da. I can't tell you how to fix it on Mac because I'm a PC person. There you go. That little buddy on the bottom. Switch the screens because you have two screens. And then take yourself off mute and we'll be good to go. Good. Good on slides, good on audio. It's all you. All Thanks. Right. Thanks, Eric. Back to the beginning. All right. Therapeutics for rare causes of cardiomyopathy. I, my name is Eric Adler. I'm a cardiologist and um, a physician scientist as well at the University of California, San Diego. And I'm going to give a broad overview of gene therapy, but really focus most of my time on uh, a project I've been working on, on the, for the last decade, which is a gene therapy for an HCM variant called Dannon disease. Here's some disclosures. Relevant to this, I'm uh, now working um, part-time with a company called Lexio Therapeutics, which is developing gene therapy for cardiomyopathies, and also I'm an investigator with Rocket Pharmaceuticals, which is developing a gene therapy for cardiomyopathy as well. So broadly speaking, when we compare the revolution that's occurred in cancer therapeutics over the last 15 or 20 year, years versus heart failure therapeutics, we can see um, big differences. But the primary difference, which I think many of you might know from um, knowing family members that have cancer, is that in general, the philosophy is when someone has cancer, you treat them as soon as the disease is detected, even in the absence of symptoms. And that the, the therapies for cancer now have evolved so quickly that we no longer just teach treat all breast cancer the same. We no longer are, are treat colon cancer the same. 
they usually take a piece of the tissue, understand the genetics and how the cancer is behaving and develop these very specific targeted therapies for cancer, these immunotherapies that have much less uh, side effects and aren't as bad as the traditional chemo that we thought of uh, when we think of cancer 20 or 30 years ago. And this has really led to a revolution in cancer care where patients are living longer and are tolerating the, the therapies much, much better. Um, and that's even in the last five years, we've seen dramatic changes on this approach of treat early, aggressively, and treat based on the genetics of the cancer. When you look at most heart failure, and frankly, um, uh, that includes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well, until the last year or two, the therapies are reserved until patients get very sick, until they develop symptoms. And we think of it like an iceberg. We wait till we see um, the iceberg, um, the part of the iceberg out of the water, but really much of the disease is occurring under the water before we even know it's, it's present. And the therapies we use are generally not based on the structure of the heart. Uh, I mean, are based on the structure of the heart. Is it thick? Is it thin? Um, is it dilated? Is it not? Um, and how the patients feel, and not really based on the genetics, on the molecular causes of disease. And I think we've obviously seen some changes of that lately uh, with the, the use of Mavicemptive, which is a, a very specific therapy based on the cause of disease. But could we even go even further and really treat, as we've been discussing over the last hour or two, based on the, the root cause is the question at hand. And this is where gene therapy comes into play. So what is gene therapy? So the, the Food and Drug Administration defines gene therapy as anything that uh, transfers genetic material that can be integrated into the genome or not, but it administers a nucleic acid um, uh, or vi viruses or genetically engineered um, organisms. Uh, the European Medical Agency basically has this, the same definition, but essentially it's administering um, some type of product that uh, expresses uh, genes in your body to change the function of a cell. Gene therapy is full of controversy. Um, the, and this is for lots of reasons, even though, um, you know, the idea of gene therapy started even in the 1970s. It was really 1980 when we saw um, an unauthorized use of gene therapy by um, when the, the transfer of beta globin into the gene of a bone marrow, uh, two bone marrow patients, um, but without meaningful uh, effect. And this was not done with um, under appropriate regulatory guidance. And um, uh, subsequently, um, the physician lost his, his funding and his chair. The first uh, therapy, gene therapy, was approved in. Uh, um, the trial was approved as it then didn't occur for 10 years later when we used a retroviruses, a different type of virus um, with patients with immunodeficiency and treated them with their genes corrected over two years. Unfortunately, that was complicated by cancers that occurred later in life of those patients and so lead to some controversy around that. And then finally, in 1999, uh, the death of, of Jesse Gelsinger at uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania where he was under in a uh, clinical trial uh, for uh, a, a blood disorder and um, unfortunately died from uh, liver failure subsequently. And this put a great hold and great controversy over the field of gene therapy. Again, when we look back at this case, there's lots of lessons learned. He got a very high dose of gene therapy, et cetera. But this, this, these kind of controversies have cast a shadow over this, this concept in general. But Nonetheless, um, things have advanced considerably since then, and I think we can move forward. This starts with the first cardiovascular gene therapies, which occurred uh, going back to 1990 um, in the labs of Betsy and Gary Nabel, who used retroviruses to um, deliver beta-galactosidase into arterial walls, thinking they could change coronary disease. And then in 1999, at the same time uh, as the previous case at CHOP, uh, we delivered VEGF uh, onto angioplasty balloon, so treating genes again to treat coronary disease. So people now focusing on gene therapy specifically for the heart starting almost 20 years ago. So why haven't we moved forward? You know, it's been at least 20 years since we started um, using gene therapy. What have been some of the barriers? Well, you can imagine with all drug discovery, 
um, it, it you move from thousands and thousands of compounds and the majority of them are not going to be effective. But uh, gene therapy has, and that's true for any any therapy, um, lots of cost, lots of time. Um, and that's important because we want to give drugs that are effective and we want to give drugs that are safe. And this has typically took taken at least a, a decade or more, 15 years or so. This is specifically through for gene therapy because when we do gene therapy trials, they usually have low numbers of patients. We're dealing with rare diseases in general. Um, and then you have specific eligibility criteria, which make it even lower. There's lots of challenges with manufacturing. So it's not easy to make a gene for gene therapy. You have to grow them up in various bacterial cultures and these big vats, and it has to be under very controlled conditions. Just making the factories to make gene therapy are millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, um, very, very expensive, laborious. Um, um, then we mentioned in the, uh, that immune profile is important. People can have antibodies to these viruses that, that were, uh, that are given, and that can make less likely to re uh, receive benefit from the gene therapy. Um, and there's issues with, um, demonstrating value, right? Most of the things that we give, most of the medicines we give, um, are thought of when they price out drugs are processed out of a lifetime of use or multiple years of use. But now we're talking about drugs that would be maybe a one-time use. On the pro side, it's curative. But on the downside, you have to recuperate all these years, decades of development in a one-time drug. So that, that cost can be astounding. And a good example was um, a drug by Bluebird Bio today uh, that was just approved for um, a blood disorder um, and it looks like it's curative for the blood disorder, but nonetheless is being priced at $2.8 million a dose. So a lot to handle. When they when they look at it, they said, well, if the patients are getting blood transfusions over a lifetime, that's close to 6 or $7 million. So we're actually saving money for the healthcare system. But you can imagine insurance companies, uh, a $2.8 million one-time drug is not an uh, easy pill uh, to swallow. So there are different gene therapy strategies, and I think we talked about this in the last talk, whether it's a missing protein, deficient proteins, silencing proteins, or editing proteins. I'm going to focus mostly on the top as we've really reviewed some of the others, but I did want to say there's some recent uh, uh, trials that have been done on, on the heart that weren't so, um, unfortunately, both were negative. Um, that were this this concept of just trying to re replace deficient proteins, and I don't think they were reviewed as of yet. One was the 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 circa two A trial, so this is called the Cupid trial, and this was delivering a gene that was in low thought to be in low amounts in the heart in patients with heart failure, a gene called circa. Unfortunately, this gene therapy uh, trial was a negative trial. It was a safe trial, um, but when we look back, it looks like. They, the, the virus used did not deliver enough gene to the heart. So undershooting the amount of gene, so the heart didn't get um, enough gene. And this kind of cast, again, a negative shadow. This, this came out, I think, in about 2018 or 17, the, final, the, the trial results, um, maybe a little bit earlier. But the bottom line was, is for many years, people were convinced, well, you can't even get genes expressed in the heart. And Circa was an example. This, this Cupid trial was an example of that. More recently, there's a, a dentalate cyclase 6 trial, a randomized trial in, in, in heart failure. I was fortunate to participate too. This again was trying to express a gene, a dental cyclase 6 in the heart of patients with heart failure again, was completely safe. So at least people weren't, um, we don't see injury, but uh, unfortunately the benefits were only moderate. And as such, um, no follow-up studies have been uh, done uh, subsequently. More recently, we are starting to see some exciting um, movement in the field of gene therapy for um, heart failure, and now specifically, these are HCM phenotypes. This is a trial I'm not involved with, but that's ongoing, looking at gene therapy for Fabry disease. So this is a trial um, being conducted currently um, for Fabry patients, which is another HCM phenocopy. And you can see the data looks 
uh, pretty promising. These patients are normally on an enzyme replacement therapy. So they're constantly having to go in for these infusions once a month. And then when we use the gene therapy in the patients, they no longer need the infusions, suggesting that the gene therapy is effective at treating uh, Fabry disease, uh, HCM phenom copy, as I mentioned. So that brings me to the work that I've been focused on for the last 10 years. And it really starts um, <clears throat> with a patient that I saw uh, while I was working at the Oregon Health and Sciences uh, uh, Hospital in Portland, Oregon. This was a 32-year-old who had what we thought at first was um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also had a skeletal myopathy. And so this speaks again to what um, we heard earlier today from Dr. Ho about the importance of genetic testing because we were faked out. Um, first, we thought he had HCM, but we noticed that his ventricle was dilated and he had skeletal muscle weakness. So we weren't so sure. So we did a biopsy of his heart and we thought, then we saw these lysosomal accumulations. So at first we thought he had a disease called Pompe disease and he got treated for Pompe disease with an enzymatic therapy, but he actually didn't get better. He got worse. And unfortunately he, he passed away. But before he passed, oh, and here, here's some of, um, I'm sorry, some more of his uh, his EKG, which was very abnormal. And again, just saying that he developed scuttle muscle weakness and um, uh, we knew it wasn't just routine HCM. Ultimately, we diagnosed him with Dannon disease. Uh, Dannon disease is a lethal disorder caused by mutations in a gene called LAMP. This is my favorite um, gene uh, currently. It's uh, the loss of this gene LAMP leads to severe uh, impairment in a process called autophagy. Autophagy is how your cells um, recycle garbage. And in these patients, they can't recycle garbage well. Um, it presents with this profound, severe hypertrophy. So some of the worst hypertrophy ever described. And Lisa was involved in one of the worst cases we know where the heart couldn't even be taken out of the chest. Um, patients generally die in the third decade of life and there's no... Uh, approved treatment for this disorder. It is often uh, confused with sarcomeric HCM, in fact. I was fortunate to, to meet uh, Morris Dannon, who um, made the first, uh, di um, diagnosed the first patient with this disease way back in 1980, when, um, and I just met him recently at a Dannon day. But in fact, this patient, just like the patient I saw, was uh, initially diagnosed with uh, Pompe's disease, um, but he had normal acid maltase levels, which was typical of Pompe's. And Morris Dannon did not accept the fact that um, this was just Pompe's disease. And he named this, he identified this new disease, which subsequently bears his name. And it was a lesson, I think, for many in the audience that they can relate to is that, uh, like great other great doctors, Morris. Did, Dan and did not just accept something that didn't make sense sense to him. And that I know that's so frustrating for many of you on this line where you're told you're having symptoms or you're told you're having something and people just say, oh no, don't worry about it, whatever before they realize in fact that you have something. And so uh, uh, you, you have to sometimes chase these diagnoses and push hard. And this is a great example of someone that did that and discovered generally uh, essentially a new disease. So I was fortunate to work with a clinical fellow who didn't accept that that patient that I saw had fab, uh, uh, Pompey's as well. Um, this is Stacy Clegg, who was a fellow with me in the lab, and she saw that patient that presented that 32-year-old male. And before he died, she biopsied his skin, and she brought his skin cells down to my lab. And in the lab, um, we I, we grew the cells out and we sequenced the cells and we identified that they were missing or they, they had a genetic mutation in the gene called LAMP. And because of that mutation, they expressed no LAMP whatsoever. So now we knew we had a patient with Dannon and not Pompey's disease, but we wanted to learn more about Dannon disease. And so to do that, we used a new technology at the time. Here's a picture of the skin biotome. Um, and here you can see we made stem cells from the patient's skin. And so we took the skin cells and we put it in a dish and we infect the dish with the virus now and, and convince the cells to become a stem cell and then take those stem cells and 
trick them to become hard cells. And once we had hard cells from the patient, we now had a little factory in which we could study the mechanism of disease and develop new therapies. And when we did that, we found that these cells were in fact very abnormal and they looked like they had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in many ways and heart failure in other ways with elevated proteins. But what was um, what was interesting at the time is that we could fix that by overexpressing the missing gene, um, suggesting that, that the problem in these cells was they just didn't express enough of that lamp and that we could fix it by giving the cells more lamp through gene therapy. So in fact, that was the next step we did. Um, here's two other members of my lab, Drs. Hashem and Nelson, who uh, made a gene therapy using adeno-associated virus. So this is the virus that we're seeing being uh, used in clinical trials up to now, and we know it affects the heart. And giving higher doses of these than that were in the previous studies, like the Cupid studies, we could get good expression of the uh, LAMP2 gene in the mouse heart. So this was really exciting for us. And at this point, we knew we needed to explore this further because we thought we might have a cure for, for Danon disease, or at least a treatment for Danon. So here we are now moving to the mouse heart and doing studies just like you would do in a person. We're doing, um, I don't know how many of you on the line have had um, hemodynamic studies or uh, a catheterization, but in this case, we do the cath on the mice. And we saw that the cath, as we give more gene therapy, improved both the squeeze of the heart and the relaxation of the heart. It prevented mice from dying and it made the biopsies that we took almost look normal. So here's the abnormal biopsy, and now we can see almost normal looking biopsies. And we could see also the gene was expressed in the heart. So this was enough data along with a bunch of safety research that we did to convince the FDA to let us uh, do a clinical trial. But when we went to the FDA, before they let us start doing the trial, they said, you haven't even really described the disease. It's so rare that you don't know, um, you can't define what success looks like. And so this was a good lesson for us. And I hope this is a good lesson for the community. I'm sure a lot of you are asked to participate are, or are participating in registries like the SHARE registry um, that doc, Dr. Ho mentioned. And I just wanted to let you know how important it is to participate in these kind of things, even if you don't think there's a direct cause and effect, because without these registries, without these kind of um, team science that includes work from the patients and the physicians, we'll never be able to make progress. So I wanna thank those that participate in trials and registries and remind those that don't, that look for opportunities because it's really how we move forward. And in this case, the FDA wouldn't let us start the trial until we knew what the disease looked like with more detail. So we actually went on Facebook um, and, you know, obviously we've talked to Lisa right away and she helped us find some patients, but even then this is a shot from my Facebook page and we went out there and looked for patients and we found a whole bunch. It turned out what we thought was a super rare disease and people said, oh, you'll never be able to recruit to the trial turned out to be not such a rare. Um, I mean, it's still a very, very rare disease, but there were patients out there looking for help and they looked on Facebook. And so we started a Facebook um, uh, a Facebook uh, support group and we rounded up patients from all around the country and ended up being from all around the world. And they came to UC San Diego and this is part of our team. Uh, one of our, these are all patients that volunteered um, to be part of the, of the trial. Uh, this is a natural history trial. So we could understand the disease and by understanding the, the, disease, we could then go to the the um, FDA and uh, uh, allow us to do uh, um, a trial. So we developed a natural history study of the disease where we could identify when patients, if they didn't get therapy, got sick. This is in men and women. This disease affects men worse than women because it's on the X chromosome, but it affected what we were surprised about is it affected women too, just at a later stage. 
Finally, then we were allowed to give to um, do our trial. Here is my my uh, one of my mentors and partners is doing the trial, Dr. Barry Greenberg. Here's inclusion criteria, and thankfully the trial is ongoing, and we've enrolled numerous uh, patients, at least five patients, and uh, we're hoping to move into larger trials. So this is actually happening as we speak. Um, it started in 2019. It got slowed down a little bit by COVID, um, but it's ongoing. And there's some uh, data that's being released publicly about this trial. I encourage you to look it up. Um, and I think it gives hope. Uh, there's numerous other trials that are ongoing, um, but are earlier in development, I should say. So they're not ongoing quite yet. And they might be more relevant to this audience. So in the new, two different companies that I know of, and probably more than that, are developing a gene therapy for uh, myosin binding protein uh, C patients. So that's, um, I'm sure some on the call have this mutation. And uh, it's a similar idea that can you can overexpress myosin binding protein C with the same virus that we're using in the Danon trial. And I think we're going to see a clinical trial for that in the next you know, one to one to two years. Uh, we'll see how efficacious that is. Um, but the the preclinical data looks quite quite promising. We're in our lab looking at another gene called troponin I. And so some of you on this call, not as many, but some may have mutations in TNNI. And so we've developed we're developing um, a gene therapy for TNI, and I, I, it's still very early in development, but it's on its way, um, and we're we're quite excited about that. So for those patients at all, and and you can see every day I'm looking. There's more and more companies. There's gene tr therapy trials for patients with ARVC for myosin heavy chain. Um, all kinds of different uh, genes are being um, done, and you can get this uh, picture here. I should say of of all these genes and the potential to upregulate or downregulate every one will hopefully change the landscape of how we how we treat these cardiomyopathies from being entirely reactive to proactive and from being non-specific to very specific. So I'm very excited about the the future. The future might include, um, as we were talking about, actual gene editing. Here's a first-in-man example of gene editing for amyloidosis, where the, the liver of patients was, was edited, and those patients are cured from a, a one-time thicker uh, one-time treatment, or at least theoretically cured. So we'll see if that occurs in the heart. I think the race is on. There's a bunch of labs working on this right now. And I, I hope to see, you know, there, there's a lot of concern for um, toxicity with this. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but that shouldn't stop us from, from moving forward. So these these rare diseases, you know, collectively, if you add them up, affect a lot of patients, and this community this community knows about it. Um, and I do believe these what we once called idiopathic cardiomyopathy or lumped together as HCM may be tre treatable with uh, gene therapy. So I'll end there. And thanks very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Eric. That was really exciting. Um, and one of our staff members has joined us. Amy's here. Um, I understand that there was a dog loose somewhere recently, so we're all better now. Tell Jude I'm glad he's home. Uh, um, so, <laughs> okay. So now we are going to go into some deep dive questions here, Eric. Um, wow. There's just so much going on in this talk <laughs> and so much promise and so much hope for the future, but a lot of <clears throat> quite intimidating and big concepts. Sure. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the May COVID cough is still here. Oh, gosh. I know it won't go away. Okay. So we're at the gate for some parts of this and we're quite far from others. What do you think patients and families need to understand <coughs> about selecting to participate in maybe clinical trials when they come up for this? Is this a everybody with a gene mutation should consider or are we talking about families with specific disease uh, manifestations? Are they the ones who should come to the forefront first? Where, where should we start? 
Well, you know, and, and Carolyn and I have been working and thinking about this a lot um, lately because there's clearly a window, at, like with all therapies, and that's true with any of the therapies that we have, that if you wait too long and you're too sick, you're less likely to benefit because now the heart has changed permanently. It's scarred. If you go too early, you're not likely to see benefit for five or 10 years. So that's not going to be so great for the trials. So we're trying to under, you know, unfortunately, what what we're learning is that only half the battle was developing the therapies. The other half is designing the trials and thinking about what endpoints we use to um, to, to determine whether the drug was effective. So um, the short answer is, I think um, the trials are going to have very st- specific criteria, and I think it's worth looking into. And, you know, it's a personal decision and each trial will be different. Um, and talking with the doctors doing the trial and seeing, you know, there's risks with every trial. Um, but there's, you know, clearly you can see some some benefit. So I think, um, you know, it's an individual discussion um, and it depends on the trial. I think in Danon, we know this disease is really bad. So um, I think it's been, uh, we've seen families really want to involve in the trial. You know, they find me on Facebook. I talk to them, on, you know, all the time because they want to get in because they know the options are really transplant or nothing. HCM is a little bit more complicated, you know, sarcomeric HCM, because as we've realized, everyone on this call is like, you know, some people will will have a pretty, some people will have really bad disease and some will do okay for a long time. So we still have a lot to learn to figure out who's best uh, for for these trials. Um, but I would say if you see one and you're potentially interested, work with the doctors to figure that out. And and they're going to pick the right, they're going to work with you to figure out the right, right people. I think um, no matter what the clinical trial is, a conversation with a clinical coordinator, clinical trial coordinator, you can't go wrong. Yeah, you're only going to hear things. You're going to learn things. You're going to have the opportunity to ask questions and therefore, you know, ask, get involved, mm-hmm. ask your doctors. And we are going to need some brave souls to step up and do these trials when it's time. We, the patient community, are leaning on you, the thought leaders, to design really good trials that are safe and that, what you said earlier, have great endpoints, which are a little challenging for a disease like HCM because we know we can have periods of time where our symptoms are minimal, and then at other points, we could become much more symptomatic, and when that's going to trip is anybody's guess. So any physician who can figure out that question, I will buy them dinner. Well, that's why um, I asked Carolyn <laughs> to help me. Yeah, Carolyn, what are we doing here? Sorry. <laughs> so um, we don't have any specific questions for you yet. I'm going to open up the floor to those questions, and I'm going to invite back the rest of our uh, panelists to um, come on in. So everybody come back on camera, and we're going to do some general questions. Eric was here, and then he left real quick. I don't know where he went. <laughs> He's back. Okay. So I'm going to go over the general questions and I'm sure by the time I get through these questions, somebody will have some really thoughtful questions for Eric. But before I do that, panelists, what do you think about what's happening in Dannon's and what do you think about the timeline to bringing some of these concepts to HCM? I know we're working on myosin binding protein C. That's my mutation. So I'm really excited for my family on that one. But what do you think the timeline is and what kind of patience in terms of time should people have to really vet out these concepts and be thinking of when they'll be available in real time? Because we're only concept right now. We may never get to real time, but Carolyn, Farhan, Colleen, what do you guys think about any of it? Well, things are are moving more and more quickly, they're accelerating. I mean, if you think about, it's not a genetic therapy, Mavicampton that just got approved, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, the whole process from, from concept in a little lab in, you know, a very tiny startup company to where it is now is about, you know, 10, a little over 10 years, basically. And 
there are, as, as, as Eric was mentioning, there are a lot of gene therapy companies out there, some smaller, some larger. They're all working on you know, various inherited disorders, including cardiac inherited disorders. And it's quite possible that some of this will, will come to fruition in, you know, in that time frame, you know, a decade or so, or, or less even, or a little bit more. Uh, as I said, you know, it's, it's <laughs> predicting the future is, is usually a dangerous game, but I think that um, things are moving so quickly and there's so many different balls in the game now that, you know, the majority may not work, but, you know, that's okay. If some of them work, that's still a big deal. In the past 10, 12 months, the HCMA has been contacted by no fewer than six organizations seeking to do genetic therapy of some derivative. And they're all looking at different targets. <clears throat> some of them are a little further in concept than others. Some of them I'm not allowed to speak of and name yet. So you'll be hearing about more and more of them as their projects evolve. Um, I do feel like we're kind of 2014 myocardia days and those early days of getting things organized and figuring out what we're doing. Um, Carolyn, what do you think about where we were, where we are and where we're going? Yeah, I mean, things are certainly moving along um, at a much faster pace than I had would have predicted, you know, moving along in terms of the companies being, you know, having very aggressive um, timelines and some of the, um, the small companies that are you know, wanting to move into the gene therapy space are getting started with clinical trials, not necessarily delivering um, therapy right now, but like you know, getting doing some of the background um, investigation and like thinking about how they might start to dose people probably within the next handful of years. Um, so, you know, there's so much still to learn, not, you know, just on the technical side of how are we going to um, optimally deliver um, the gene therapy, um, but also um, more on um, the, you know, kind of the trial trial strategies um, side, like uh, Farhan and, and Eric were alluding to, like, what um, are the best patients to, to look at and what outcomes are we going to look at to see if there's an effect? Um, you know, there are practical outcomes, like, did we, were we able to successfully reprogram the genes or edit the genes, you know, that where we would need a, you know, a biopsy and like actually look at the heart tissue and say, you know, what do the, what do the genes and proteins look like? Did we accomplish what we were trying to accomplish? And then, you know, more meaningfully, like, did that do any good? Um, you know, so I think that there's still a lot of important questions that need to be sorted out, um, uh, you know, for these things to really um, move forward. <laughs> Kelly, that, yeah, yeah. The thing I think about as a genetic counselor is, you know, so much of my job is making sure that a patient and a family understands what genetic testing can and can't do for you and your family, but that is constantly changing. So when I started practicing and specializing in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it was the evidence was such that the research that had been done was such that the genetic test was only to help your family, unless your, you happen to find out you had one of these non-sarcomeric mimics like Dannon or amyloidosis. In the last few years, we've gotten to a point with some of the insights from the share registry where we can actually say things like, hmm, maybe the severity of your disease in your future, you know, depends on your genetic test result. Maybe the chance of your family members also having HCM depends on your genetic test results. And now we're in this situation that the last two talks really highlighted where the ability for you to even consider some of these trials and if we get lucky, eventual effective approved therapies depends on having had genetic testing. And that is actually something that's happening all across genetics for different diseases. You know, this idea that there are genetic tests that we've, historically said, this doesn't change anything for you. We already know you have the disease. The genetic test just says this is why, but because either targeted therapies or informed therapies or gene therapies are advancing relatively quickly, even if there isn't one of those for your disease or your gene today, it's enough on the horizon that I think there are many patients or families who might find that as a very 
motivating reason in and of itself to speak to your next husband? I am very much of the opinion that everybody with an HCM diagnosis on ECHO should inquire about genetic testing and identify if they can, what the mutation is for the purpose of looking at the family potentially, and then what else is coming down the stream? You know, we don't really know. PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnostics, do you want to start your family that way and maybe remove HCM from the from the family tree. And that would be nice. Some people may just want to know whether they carry the gene or not, and they're making decisions based on their genetic status, whether that's employment, whether that's education, maybe they're giving that some thought early on. So I think the value of genetic testing has grown over time. Um, Even if you don't have a known mutation, you still learn something. You didn't have one of the mimickers and you don't have something that you can use to screen your family with. And maybe next week we'll come up with something new that we can test you for, and maybe we'll learn about more genetics. Um, That tends to move a bit slower than I think anybody would like, but it's, it, you can learn by the negative information as well. No mutation found, you learn that you have no identifiable mutation. Um, I'm, I'm just going to stay with Colleen here for a moment. Can you speak to the risks associated to submitting to genetic testing um, to have results to a research database, and I'm using my air quotes here, people, research database um, is a little different than your clinical file, so they are viewed a little bit differently. Um, Are there impacts to children's future career options, medical life, et cetera? Would you like to discuss Gina? That is a whole webinar. (laughs) Okay, so um, when you get genetic testing in a clinical situation, Uh, it is covered by the laws for privacy and confidentiality. And in fact, it's actually covered more carefully and tightly than your other other parts of your medical record. So that's important. When you choose to engage in a research study that involves your genetic information, it can vary a lot. And it really matters to ask the person conducting that research study and engaging you in that research study what protections they have for your privacy and the privacy of your genetic information. So it's a really important conversation to have. The last question about impact on your child's insurability, employability, that is partly related to how is your or your child's genetic information protected in that research study, which I just mentioned, which varies a lot and you need to ask. But it's also related to what legal protections do and do not exist in our country um, for what we call genetic discrimination, which is treating a human differently in a variety of ways based on either their family history or their genetic test results, their genetic information. So GINA that Lisa mentioned, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which folks, patient advocates like Lisa worked tirelessly for over a decade to get passed. And prior to it passing, There were lots of people who didn't sign up for genetic research or get genetic testing because of the lack of protection. So I I cannot talk about GINA without the kudos to the many patient advocates who made it happen. What is GINA? GINA is a federal bill that had wide um, support from both parties, Democrat and Republican, to protect against genetic information being used to discriminate against a person in employment or health insurance. So have- Education. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's a problem, but I'm not surprised because you were there involved in the original process that you know things I don't know. Um, However, so what that means is genetic testing, family history should not affect one's ability to get health insurance or to get a job or be retained in a job or aspects of education that Lisa can tell you about. 
And that has been pretty steady and only honestly got stronger with the American, with the Affordable Care Act um, that was passed under the Obama administration. There's even stronger protections out of that. Exceptions, if you work in the military um, or other aspects of the federal government, you do not have the same protection to talk to your genetic counselor. Um, find a genetic counselor to talk to. So health insurance, employment, education, great. Life insurance, long-term care insurance, disability insurance, we have no federal protections. There are spotty state level protections. So there are families that choose to go get life insurance on the person getting genetic testing. I'm talking about people who do not currently have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who have a family history of it and are trying to find out if they inherited it. There are people who will go get those insurances before they engage in the genetic testing process. It's also important that you know that even just getting your heart tested, not your genes, go get that echo because you have a family history, go get your kid an echo can also affect that because if you take in your 19 year old or your, who can do anything with their 19 year old? We have no control over it then. If you take in your 12 year old to get a echocardiogram because you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and they get a diagnosis, even with no genetic testing, that actually probably has a bigger risk for their ability to get life insurance, long-term care insurance, disability insurance. So um, any other questions on Gina, you can go to the website. There's information on Gina there. And uh, you can also call the office and we can kind of walk you through other pieces of it. Um, how many um, genes are there now associated with Pathogenic mutations for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Carolyn. 2014, no. there were eight no. when this person had tested. No, I'm giving it to Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> I Carolyn. feel like Colleen is much better suited to answer this, but you know, the, the money's still in the sarcomere genes and the eight core sarcomere genes. Um, the, um, that's where we're going to find the greatest um, concentration of positive pathogenic or likely pathogenic um, um, variants and also the ones that we can understand most because you know like Colleen was saying you know if you look sometimes you find and sometimes what we find we can't understand and we have a much more familiarity and understanding of the sarcomere genes. Um, the panels now include over 30 different genes um, that are arrayed on this so they're all going to be tested simultaneously. You can get panels for 100 genes. You can sequence your whole exome or you can sequence your whole genome um, but by and large for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the yield of clinically actionable results, results that we understand Understand, you know, how they may impact your health um, um, does not go up the bigger you get. Um, so, you know, even having a pretty Spartan panel from a, a while ago, as long as it included the eight sarcomere genes and the mimics, um, uh, you know, for um, Thannin, for Fabre, for amyloid, um, that that is good. There are some, um, you know, additional genes that you know we would typically want to be seen. They're pretty rare, um, but you know we, you know, you'd want to see that. But you know, um, um, HCM genetic testing is usually not something. If you've had it within the past decade, you probably don't need to to upgrade. But Colin, what do you think? Yeah, I just um, pulled up the ClinGen paper from three years ago. So three, uh, it was published three years ago, but probably six years ago a bunch of us from across the world got together to really look carefully at how many genes that are called HCM genes, either in scientific research or in what laboratories are selling, really can we trust are connected to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we looked at this very, very carefully to say, what are we confident in? And it came out with exactly what, what Carolyn said, which is the eight sarcomere genes are really where it's at. Many patients, especially in America, are currently getting gene panels because of the opportunity for no cost genetic testing. If you wanna hear me and Lisa rant about this, there was a podcast we did a few months ago <laughs> um, that have close to a hundred genes. So eight genes plus a handful of mimics, gonna tell you about the mimics in a second. Eight genes that are, that are strongly clearly associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and then in order to get your genetic test for free, you're also getting another 92-ish genes that will almost certainly, in recent studies, 75% of you will have a bunch of noise, uncertain things, things to ignore in the rest of those genes. It's important you know and your doctor knows to ignore those things. 
So the eight genes in the sarcomere are, are key. There were three genes that we were like, yeah, this is probably real. One of those was a sarcomere gene. Um, and then there were 38, mm, I'm doing math. There were 30, no, 22 genes that we were like, mm, somebody reported once that might be an HCM gene, but it's not convincing enough yet. And then when you look at like the mimics or what are called sometimes called syndromic genes, and that includes mostly things that affect kids. We've talked about some things, Fabre, amyloid, those is today that affect a, adults when it comes to an HCM situation more often. But we also heard Dr. Adler talk about Pompeii tends to affect kids more. Noonan is another one. There were 12 genes that um, could be associated with thickness in the heart, but it was due to a different genetic disease than hypertrophic pregnancy. Thanks for covering me, Carolyn, while I pulled up the paper that I don't have memorized. <laughs> that was quite impressive. You pulled yeah. that one right up. Yeah, it was Kat, Colleen is an expert with this. And, you know, the um, Noonan um, related genes, that whole pathway, um, weren't included on the very first genetic test. And I think it's reasonable to, to have those if your genetic testing did not include that sometimes. Um, there can be very cardiac isolated features of Noonan, um, Noonan is a syndrome, and there usually comes with a whole host of other things that um, allow us to spot it, mm -hmm. sometimes not. Um, so I would say um, that would be one thing to get to get repeat genetic testing if your panel did not include um, that pathway. But I'm sad, sad, so sad to say I would agree with Carolyn. If you've had genetic testing the last eight to 10 years, you unfortunately don't need your genes analyzed again. Yeah, absolutely but you might need your results interpreted again, which are two different things. So you go back I, to the records and get that and find, figure out exactly what the mutation is, get those papers, bring them back with you to clinic the next time you go. Um, I'm a, there was about to be a new publication that I, I worked with a committee on for about four years on how to go through the process of variant of uncertain significant reclassification and reevaluation. It's more of a thought paper on, this is a really big messy problem and how are we going to put a system in place to deal with this? Who owns the patient? Who owns the data? Does the lab have a responsibility? Does the doctor have a responsibility? Does the patient have a responsibility? Should have access to this? Who should be contacting the lab directly? Should it be the patient, the doctor? We broke down a thousand questions and we gave some suggestions to move forward with both for laboratories and clinical practice. And that should be published, I believe in the next 60 days. And it'll probably take another 10 years to get change in how we do things. But it's something that I think we all need to be focusing on because there's a lot of the US's variant of uncertain significance out there. Um, so it gets confusing. I am going to say thank you to the people on Facebook for watching today. And I'm going to say goodbye to them all. So everybody wave goodbye, Facebook people. And then we are going to...